Welcome everyone to the Organic Confluences Summit presented by the Organic Center. We're thrilled to have you here with us today. Before we get started, I have a few quick tips and reminders. Please, uh, we would encourage you to use the speaker view in the top right corner so you can see who's speaking and you can see our interpreters. If you are requiring interpretation today and you would, uh, you can, if you could please notify us through uh, renaming yourself, whether it's ASL or Spanish, we'll be able to put you into breakout rooms later appropriately. Please feel free to have your camera on. As I just mentioned, we really do enjoy seeing all of your smiling faces, uh, but please do keep your microphones muted. We will mute if we hear any background noise. Uh, use your Zoom reactions at the bottom of the screen and in the chat box to the left of the screen to engage with our speakers throughout the day and the audience. Uh, please keep an eye on the chat box for conversations and responses to each of our speakers, links where you can take action throughout the meeting, and just letting us know how much you're enjoying everything that you're learning today. And with that, I will now hand things over to the Organic Center's Director of Science Programs, Dr. Jessica Shade, to kick off the show. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Libby. And thanks, everyone, so much for joining us for the first of our three-part organic ag tech-focused confluences events. Um, I'm Jessica Shade, the Director of Science Programs for the Organic Center. And I'll be popping on the screen to introduce speakers and help facilitate the conference along with the Organic Center's Associate Director of Science Programs, Amber Siliga. So one of us will be popping on from time to time. Um, today, we're gonna to be talking about the opportunities of ag tech for moving organic forward, the potential pitfalls of ag tech, data sovereignty, farmer perspectives on what works, what doesn't work in terms of ag tech, um, how farmers can sort through all of the tech that they're bombarded with to figure out what works for them and a lot more. Um, rather than Q&As after each talk, we're going to be doing two breakout sessions. Everyone will get automatically assigned to a breakout room and we'll get to talk about their thoughts with a few guiding questions. Um, the breakouts are our chance to synthesize the information that we're going to be hearing about. So please stick around for those. They're going to be fun. Um, and this is kind of a packed agenda, as you will notice, with no break scheduled. But if you need to duck out for a bit, don't worry. We're going to record all the talks and post them later. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, this is just the first conference we're holding on the ag tech topic. Um, on February 10th, we'll be hosting a conference focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in ag tech. And then February 24th through 26th, we'll be partnering with the Gathering for Open Agricultural Technology to hold a hackathon focused on organic. Um, and you will get to learn more of that soon. And before we get this show on the road, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, this conference is funded by USDA NEPA AFRI Agriculture Systems and Technology Grant. So a huge thanks to AFRI. Um, and I also want to thank our other sponsors, Driscoll's, Organic Valley, Stonyfield, and True Organic. Um, so I'm not going to take up too much time here. So I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Dr. Kathleen Merrigan probably needs no introduction with this audience because she's been an integral part of organics and she helped develop USDA's organic labeling rules while she was head of USDA AMS back in the late 90s, early aughts. And she is currently the Kelly and Brian Sweetie Professor in the School of Sustainability and Executive Director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University and has been celebrated by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, and I love the title of her talk, Organic Ag Tech, Oxymoron, or Golden Opportunity. It's a perfect talk to set us up for this conference. So I will pass it over to you, Kathleen. Ooh, Kathleen, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Okay, let's get these slides up there. Okay, back one, ah, fine. All right, Jessica already shared my title talk. I'm really excited about this 
um, event. I think it's long overdue. I hope we have a unfettered, robust discussion. Um, at the beginning, though, I do want to acknowledge there was a big announcement in Washington, D.C. yesterday. Congressman Peter DeFazio has announced he will um, retire at the end of this term. So that means we have both Pat Leahy and Peter DeFazio, our, our Senate and House champions of organic, retiring at the same time. Uh, it's a challenging environment, and this is a critical discussion as we start to think about um, what are the next 30, 31 years of organic going to be as we look back and celebrate the 30 years since passage of the Organic Foods Production Act? Uh, let's see, here we go. So uh, technology, I just want to have some scene setting comments. I mean, I've always thought technology is sort of a neutral thing and I'm, I'm not alone. I just pulled out these couple of quotes for you to take a look at. Um, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really how the technology is used. I love Noam Chomsky's quotes like, well, you can use like a hammer, you can crush someone's skull or it's, it's uh, just you're hammering a nail, good or bad, we don't know. And that really brings me to think about our origins. I was involved in writing the Organic Foods Production Act for Senator Leahy back in 1989-90. And when you look back at that original piece of legislation, there's no prohibition on biotechnology. I was a young staffer in the Senate and I had hopes and dreams of biotechnology doing great things. And so we were, silent on it in the law. Now, fast forward to the various rulemakings when USDA came out with their first proposed rule in 1997, it uh, asked the question, should biotech be a part of this? And the 275,603 comments that USDA got back was a resounding no. Uh, they talked, uh, consumers talked about the big three irradiation, sewage sludge, and biotech, that that had no place in organic. And of course, the final rule um, had a definition of excluded methods, sort of biotech in its broader context, saying that's not a part of organic, and that's been true to this day. I don't think we're going to anytime soon revisit biotech. I think consumers identify organic as non-GMO. But let me just suggest biotech is only one aspect of ag tech that we may talk about during these conferences. Uh, the current controversy in our world these days around ag tech is really around controlled environment agriculture. And you hear people say, well, if it's soilless agriculture, it's soulless agriculture. It's hard for me to engage in this conversation because I'm currently living in Arizona where we're a very thirsty state. Um, it's, uh, I live in essentially desert land. And when you think about some of these controlled environment atmosphere, um, uh, agriculture, um, structures and they can save as much as 95% of water that is used in production, I'm not sure I'm closed off to that thinking. But I just want to say that, um, again, ag tech, big, big universe. Um, last year, I had some graduate students do a project and what is it? innovation mean in the context of organic? And anyone can go to the Sweetie Center website at ASU and download this report. Among other things, the students did a survey and they reached out to all kinds of leaders in the organic industry asking, what's your take on innovation? What should we be looking at? And what we found was there was uh, answers all over the map a lot of diverse opinions, and it makes what we're doing here today seem so very timely. If you go to agfunder.com, which is an incredibly great resource, uh, they um, have this slide in a report where they're reviewing where ag tech is at in around food uh, in the last year. You can download the report for free. They give this ag food tech category definitions. So you know, we've mentioned biotech, which is that top left-hand corner 
uh, box, but look at, they're all over the place. It's e-grocery, it's um, uh, electrified machinery. It's a lot of data um, collection and usage. It's even FinTech, which someone had to explain to me recently means different financial tools that farmers and others in the agricultural ecosystem may use. So we're really talking about a very broad category of innovations that should all be on our minds these days. And, and part of the reason is it's big money. So in 2020, AgFunder um, estimates about 30, uh, $30 billion were put into ag tech food areas. And, and that's an amazing amount of money. And it's actually very welcome investment at a time when public dollars, unfortunately, have been stagnant, if not decreasing. So what is this money doing in the space? How can we help steer it, at least understand it um, at a minimum? but ideally help steer it. So I'm just gonna reintroduce myself. Jessica introduced me as this person has this long history of organic, which is absolutely true. But in the last few years, I've also been involved in the venture capital space around food and agriculture. And in particular, I'm a venture partner at a European-based firm called Astonor. And um, I'm, saying this because I do see a lot of these ag tech innovations as, um, as, as fitting into the organic space. And I also want you to know, I'm about to give you a little snippet of eight companies that I think give a range of what's going on in ag tech and I'm financially interested in them. So I, I declare my conflict here. So um, here's one that you may have heard of, uh, Appeal Sciences, they're in Santa Barbara. They um, the, the, one of the uh, founders, James Rogers, came out of his PhD dissertation where he has developed a biofilm that goes over these avocados, they do mangoes, they do a lot of different produce, and it ultimately uh, retards the spoilage of the produce and then uh, extends its life and, and has potential of really uh, reducing food waste in our food system. Really novel, really exciting, probably estimated at over a billion dollar company now. Magro. Okay, I'm really interested in this company. This company is using um, uh, magnetism technology to um, change how the farm machinery is dispersing pesticides so that um, much less pesticide and therefore much less water because they're mixing it up right in the water to apply it uh, is used. And you might say, well, Kathleen, we don't in organic use synthetic pesticides for the most part, but we use other kinds of approved pesticides. We have OMRI approved uh, materials that this technology could be applied to. So I'm excited about anything that reduces all inputs. Insect. So this is a company in uh, France. It's not a one of a kind, but it's the largest of uh, a kind. And they're developing different kinds of insect protein to um, be used for uh, aquaculture operations and for livestock feed and potentially pet food, uh, potentially human food down the road. My husband's very nervous. So I'm going to feed him some of this. Um, in that innovation report that I talked about that my students did, one of the questions that they asked was, do we need now a standard for insect protein given um, the interest in this area and especially when it comes to aquaculture where we're taking a lot of very small fish out of the ocean to feed farm fish, we're disrupting the ocean ecosystem, it's just wacky. Nopla, all right, so you look at this little box, you could actually eat the, um, the container that that soy sauce is in. So we don't have standards in organic around uh, around packaging. 
And maybe we should, maybe that's the next one of the next horizons. And so what can we be doing thinking about packaging and all the innovation that's going on there? Vivint, okay, I love this company. And I've always been intrigued about the communication between plants. And so this company has figured out how to track the electric, electrical signals between plants outside of the laboratory, bring it to the farm in a real way that can help the farmer understand more of what's going on in the fields. Alpha Bio. So um, this is a company that's in that larger space of biostimulants, biocontrols, um, a lot of innovation going on there. I've always been a big fan of Marone Bio Innovations in Davis, California, Pam Marone, super champion of everything biocontrol. Lots of stuff going on there. What are we watching? What are we encouraging? Monarch, okay, I like this tagline, the Telsa of agriculture. So um, new efforts to have electrified tractors um, that collect a lot of data, interpret it for farmers. Um, and what I particularly like about this company is they're very small scale tractors and a lot of uh, what they do is piloted in India among small farmers. And this is my last of the eight small hold, which is a hyper local mushroom producing company uh, where, um, and, and, and it's working with organic growers. So, and, and big places like Whole Foods, so that um, we're having that healthy mushroom content in our diets uh, really right around the corner. So that's just to give you a little um, taste of what's out there in terms of um, ag tech. There are quite a few different companies out there, um, venture capital firms that are investing across the university space to agricultural organizations like Western Growers. There are a number of these ag shark, um, what we like to call ag shark competitions, just like um, uh, the shark tank on television that we all watch. There are a lot of places that are inviting innovators to come in, pitch their ideas, decide um, what to fund and support, and it's pretty exciting. So as we look to the future of organic, I do want to mention that Organic Trade Association is partnering with us at the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems, hosting a series of workshops on the future of organic. Um, and we hope to have a report come out this, we will, we not hope, we will have a report that will come out this spring, um, summarizing our findings. People are really putting on their thinking caps, trying to figure out where the next innovations need to be. Could it be around water? As I mentioned, could it be about packaging? Where are we? We are now 31 years, November 4th since passage of the Organic Foods Production Act, where are we gonna be 31 years from now? So uh, the answer to the question, oxymoron or golden opportunity, for me is golden opportunity. I think there's so much excitement and things to explore in ag tech that it's so timely for us to be meeting today and thinking through what we need to embrace and the very detailed processes that we're going to have to follow to build consensus around emerging technologies and processes with USDA to get them improved for the organic label. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, not only was that thought provoking, but I really I appreciated the, um, the examples that you gave of the wide range of um, technology, eye technology that we can start thinking about for organic. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Mursky, who is a research ecologist in the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Laboratory at the Beltsville Ag Research Center in Maryland. Dr. Mursky was the chair of the Northeast Cover Crop Council for four years 
and he co-leads the National Precision Sustainable Ag Team, as well as GROW, which is a national integrated weed management team, and a national cover crop breeding team. Uh, this man is very busy. His work is accelerating and merging precision and sustainability solutions by um, creating transdisciplinary research, extension, and education programs. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Stephen. Great. Can you hear me? We can. You sound great. Um, can you see my screen? We cannot see your screen, no. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Don't worry about it. Must have lost where I, where you guys are. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, you should see my screen now, is that right? Yeah, we see a group of slides. All right, how about now? Is that the, you see the full screen mode? Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, a lot of things open on the desktop. Uh, so be patient with me today. I, I just got over a cold from last night, so I'm still a little under the weather, but uh, hopefully I don't lose my voice. I love the last presentation. Thank you, Kathleen, for all of the optimism, because I'm going to just continue that energy going forward as far as what I think is possible uh, in organic, at least what we're seeing thus far. So hopefully people like my next slide, or they either like it or they hate it. Stephen, could you unmute? That's weird. Uh, I think the, the possibilities of technology and agriculture at this point now is, is fairly unlimited. It's really the, the next revolution. And what we're seeing for organic, I think organic is probably, of, of all the se sectors in agriculture, is one of the ones to probably see some of the biggest impact just because of the challenges and constraints that go into organic agriculture. Uh, what technology brings is, is really transformative. So I think the future is very bright. And this is because the robots are coming, right? It's really all about the robots. I mean, there are a lot of things that are coming in the tech space, uh, but for organic, it's all about robots. The ability to have kind of a range of different technology applications to work in organic systems. This is a technology, these are swarming robots that were built for conventional systems for spraying, uh, but this type of technology is coming uh, in all forms and, and, and many that we're gonna serve right into organic agriculture. And I think that um, really the heart of it is around computer vision and AI. Right, that's really what's transforming what we can do, to be able to see things and then inform some kind of a technology to do something, whether it's to select, whether it's to pick a fruit, uh, whether it's to rate or, or to determine quality. We're gonna see huge uh, improvements in our organic capabilities because of computer vision and AI, and then using those applications and robotic platforms. That's gonna enable us to get really the merger between precision ag, which has not been a, 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 a primary focus in a lot of organic systems and, and merge that with the key sustainable ag strategies that we know are at the heart of organic agriculture, which brings that adaptive and regenerative and resiliency to the systems. Here's just an example, like this is an EarthSense robot driving through a field and look at this, in real time, it's going across a field and measuring, you know, it's being able to identify just the stem and get stem diameter information. And, and this is, I mean, this is one minor little thing that robots can do, but just think about the ability to drive across a field and be able to scan every single plant. What this now allows us to do is start to make decisions at the individual plant level. We can start doing really hyper-precise management, right? So one industry, I think that, um, uh, let's, let's get out of there. 
Uh, one industry that I think it, it really stands to benefit a lot is, for example, the dairy industry. Uh, you know, and, and uh, these concepts that I've laid out in these bullets really apply, you know, broadly to organic farming systems, but you can really see its applications in, in dairy operations, particularly the work-life balance, putting time back into the farmer's hands, you know, the, the amount of time commitment required, you know, in the, for the life of a dairy person is tremendous. And all of a sudden to be able to automate some of these workflows puts time back into the hands of the farmer. That's not just to be able to do better and be more productive and to do other things, but it's also to have a quality of life and build that sustainability, you know, that, that, that third part of the leg of the sustainability stool, if you will. So time savings, I think it really widens the margins of success, right? I mean, on a lot of these farms, everybody has to be both a generalist and a specialist, particularly on the small farms where you don't have a tremendous amount of staff. You are both the generalist and the specialist and you are just flooded, right? To be able to give some of that time back and to be able to, you know, enable, you know, small farmers that have these tight margins to have more ability is pretty awesome. Um, and I think that the, the big part of what's so cool about these technologies is a lot of them are scale neutral. We're developing systems that, that the, the unit in which a given technology operates at, it's no longer um, that bigger and is better. It's just how many of those units you have. Do you have five units? Do you have 10? Do you have 20? Do you have 30? That's gonna dictate the size of your uh, farming operation. So in some cases for organic, this will enable scaling. And in many cases, this will um, help uh, support and sustain um, the smaller farmer in these, in, in, with these scale neutral technologies. But also in the case of animals, we get this targeted care or site specific management in the, in the context of plants. And, um, and then also this comfort factor and consistency for cows. I've heard and read several articles where in production is increasing and, the, and, and, and cow health in, in vitality is increasing just because of these automated milkers. Uh, another aspect of what, what robots are gonna bring the future of farming systems is this resiliency to climate um, in a number of ways. And actually this is a perfect example of this. Organic agriculture, particularly uh, you know, field and vegetable crop production that's really tillage intensive is greatly limited by your workable days that's driven by precipitation, right? You know, what, what size of a rain event you get and how large of a rain event and what kind of soil type you have is going to dictate how frequently and how much time you have to do your field operations. We can start dialing back the technology to ultra lightweight solutions that can get into the fields and wetter conditions. You start to open up the windows of opportunity to more workable days for farmers. There's a whole host of other climate resiliency benefits, but I think that's a one to really hone in on. And then, I mean, really, this is the Cadillac, right? I mean, I think that everybody is seeing and hearing the buzz around weeding robots. If there is one robotic system that is getting the most attention and having some of the biggest impact, I think this is it, right? We're seeing like every week a new startup company is, is putting out the next robot, the next weeding solution um, and, and different mechanisms on how they're going to impact the weeds. And I think this has huge economic and environmental implications. We know in organic agriculture that we have incredible amount of tillage and soil disturbance and, and, and slow methodical weed management solutions that require steel in the field. And that is really greatly limits the ability to scale up. And it also has a lot of concerns as far as soil health. So to be able to put robots into these systems that can do precision management, less disturbance to the system, um, and are potentially using less fuel, a lot of these big, huge rigs that are moving a lot of soil require a lot of energy um, and uh, a lot of the farmer's time as well. So here's another place that that time factor comes in. I, I want to highlight a, a piece of technology that I'm kind of excited about. We're sort of in the early phases of, of conceiving of this approach and, and what we can do with this. But I, I think that this is going to be transformative for organic farming. And it might not be popular uh, to, with everybody. I, and I understand why. Uh, but uh, we know that organic herbicides are effective. We've demonstrated that many, many, many times. There's, the literature is rich with showing the efficacy of organic herbicides on phytotoxicity and killing of a plant. Now, the persistence and the, the um, longevity of that weed control is certainly not like it is with 
you know, um, conventional agricultural chemistries, but we know they're effective. The big problem with these herbicides is they're incredibly costly. It's just not cost effective to put out these organic herbicides and large production acreage. But what if we could start delivering these herbicides like a printer, like a micro jet printer delivers ink to a piece of paper that we could put highly concentrated organic herbicides at the growing point of a weed and terminate that weed with these very, very like high concentration, but very low volume doses and be able to target individual weeds. Well, the technology is here now. The ability to see weed and target weed exists. And that's already, for example, like Blue River technology, that's happening. Can we bring that to organic so that we can start to get in row weed control. You saw in those earlier pictures, the robots are going to get the weeds between the row. We're not worried about that anymore, right? That's that's coming. And we're like, within the next 10 years, we're going to see that completely take off as the between row weed control with robots. But it's those weeds that are in the row that you risk the damaging of the crop as well, that are a real challenge and some of the biggest competitive effects we see in organic systems. Can we target them? And they can be used kind of like a nozzle system that is, is specifically only targeting the weeds and then putting down micro volumes. So you're just essentially putting a little droplet on that weed. I think this could be a game changer for, you know, really expanding what we can do in organic. A system that's near and dear to my heart, I've been working on for several decades now. And quite honestly, the last five years have been slowed down just because we've been running out of innovation options. We, we really pushed the, the envelope on this cover crop based you know, rotational no-till organic grain production systems. We, we did a lot of good work, a lot of scientists across the country, uh, but it's been really still sort of hitting some roadblocks. Could you imagine if we could start to get some in-row weed control as well with some of these highly precise spray technology? I think this would really enable a practice that I know a lot of folks are really excited about. Lastly, I think that um, one of the things that comes with these kinds of technologies that provide scale neutrality is the, the potential to see greater diversity in the landscape. So diversifying our crop rotations. Up above, you're seeing a, an image of Illinois, corn soybean production acreage versus California. You can see the di differences in diversity of, of farming systems there. Could you imagine if we started to see more diversity in some of these less diverse ecosystems? I think that, that robots are gonna help provide that and, and de-risk some of those solutions. But moreover, what we're seeing is no longer as bigger as better with robots. Because they're scale neutral, you can start to manage micro sites and have micro drainages or micro wetlands in a field and remove some of that manage marginal land or better manage marginal land so that you can get a, a, another set of benefits to our farming systems and, and organic ag. So what's the role of the uh, public sector researchers in this space? I think our role is twofold. These are the areas that I'm most excited about and, and invest most of my time in is, is transdisciplinary science and building translational research pipelines. So, you know, the future, you know, role for researchers is that we've got to break down our data silos. We have to have highly coordinated transdisciplinary teams and we need to merge our data together so that we're not just doing these two year, three year, one and done studies that are isolated in space or isolated in time that we're linking up our science so we can get better spatial, temporal, and more site-specific information so that we can really bring precision and sustainable ag together. Another place that I see is this translational research pathway. And, I, and what, what this allows us to do is really de-risk technology for the private sector. So much technology exists at the proof of concept phase by engineers, they develop a new proof of concept, and that's really what happens in academia is they're moving on to the next proof of concept. Those technologies sit there until someone picks it up and operationalizes it to bring it you know, to the private sector. And the private sector, that's a really risky uh, proposition. And so the public sector can play a huge role in operationalizing and translating that science. And so here is kind of a five phase pathway that I see is critical to building these translational research pathways. It's taking that proof of concept technology. It's then looking at it in real world scenarios and real world problems. You know, so showing that the technology does the thing, right? Does it measure the weed or does it measure the uh, soil in some way? 
But then it's building in all of the ruggedness and the, the networking capabilities and the storage retrieval systems of the data, built, operationalizing that technology so it can be done at scale across many different users and humans who have a wide range of technology backgrounds from very low tech users to very high tech users. It's getting that user experience, it's iterating and continuing to improve that function and design, and then getting it out into the landscape and training and educating. And that de-risking will really facilitate the tech to the private sector, but what it also does when we release this in the public sector as an open access and open source solutions, what then this enables is smaller companies, not, not, not I'm sorry, I hope there were four farmers in here, but I meant like smaller startup companies and, and smaller organizations to be able to make use of all these workflows and build on this instead of having to have the R&D teams to create that. The public sector is distributed across the landscape. We have a ton of scientists linking that up really builds that value. So I'd remiss to not show a good example of a team that's doing that. This is a team that I'm part of called the Precision Sustainable Ag Team. And I, it really does all of that. It builds the transdisciplinary science and the translate translational research pathways. So it's bringing together scientists across the country. In this context here, this, some of these early efforts have all been around cover crops and reduced tillage systems, uh, but it's, it's aggregating historical, current, and future data sets. It's building a cyber infrastructure that supports automation of that data acquisition and structuring of that data and, and providing the documentation of how to use and access that data. It's feeding into recommendation systems and decision support tools. We have technology that's on farms that are monitoring uh, what's going on on these farms and then feeding that data back into our uh, databases that's then further improving the tools and creating these positive feedback loops that are necessary. Um, and this is just giving an example of some visuals of some of the farms and some of our research stations and green circles and on-farm network. Um, this is, you know, just to make the point that a big part of what that makes this role is, is putting technology everywhere for monitoring systems and creating data standards across the network. I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. And so I want to give just a nice little example of some of the tech that we really, that shows that translational research pathway. And I know there's a number of my colleagues on the ticket for today that will be presenting in a deeper dive on some of these technologies. So stick around, particularly for Paula's talk later in the day. Um, she was instrumental in developing a lot of these technologies with the team. But we're developing low cost IoT systems that allow us to monitor in the case of this left water stress in crops um, to, de to develop weed um, species identification and biomass reconstruction. Part of this has been facilitated by these low cost platforms, this robotic platform, which we like to refer to as our award winning Benchbot, uh, which is a technology that greatly facilitates both the R&D around the camera technologies, but also building out these image repositories. Uh, and so these are all low cost solutions that are open source and open access. We're sometimes building on what's commercially available or developing and innovating some of our own tech, but all of this is available. And all of this goes through these iterations of alpha and beta testing and networking and ruggedizing these technologies so that by the time it's ready for you know, broad scale commercial use, we've kind of de-risked these solutions for a lot of folks. I should check on my time here. I guess I'm doing okay, yeah. So um, let me give you a little deeper dive. So here's an example, a perfect example of what the research community can do to de-risk solutions and make it accessible both to big ag, but also the smaller startup companies. We're developing a high resolution, open access, annotated weed image repository. I say weeds, but really it includes crops and cover crops as well. This image repository is where we've just annotated all these images and put them into an open access repository so that any technology company in the public or in the private sector can take these image repositories and innovate on them. They might want to use it to drive certain robotic applications. They might want to use it in research for mapping of crops and weeds. They might want to use it for a whole host of different applications that we can't even conceive of now. But here the public sector can bring together large teams of scientists, develop these image repositories of weeds all across North America, and then make that publicly available. And so that's an example of how we kind of fit into that. 
we're not going to see, you know, necessarily in the public sector, a lot of, you know, robotic startup companies, but we need to help provide the robust and rigorous um, uh, computer vision and AI, you know, capabilities for those robotic platforms. And so here's just some visuals of some of our cameras and a, a bench bot doing its job. Here's an example. You know, the bench bot is really instrumental in helping to build this image repository. We don't do this in the greenhouse. We do this in outside conditions, set what we call semi-field. So that allows us to get, you know, plants grown in uh, real sunlight, but build these image repositories of really small seedlings of weeds so that the technology can see weeds that are just at the cotyledon stage and directly target them. Here's an example now of an application. Now this is a research application, but I'll describe a production application in a second. So here uh, is using GoPro technology. This is some of the work I hope Hope and Paula was gonna really break apart later. We're using just off the shelf technology, a video camera, setting it up with a tablet and, and, a, and a monopod here. And we're walking across fields and training uh, this technology to be able to build 3D, 3D reconstructions of plants. So you can see here, this is a coffee plant. Uh, and you can see the ability to develop that re reconstruction of that. Well, this requires that image repository. Just to build this biomass 3D reconstruction, you have to know what the species is. So this is just an example of an application of the image repository. And then now the collection collective between the image repository and this ability to do reconstruction now allows us to map on the fly crop performance, weeds performance, distinguish between crops and weeds. And you can think of all the ways that mapping those dynamics could be used um, for management and organic systems, like directly targeting weeds with robotic platforms. Lastly, um, I, I wanna highlight another example of, of, of this translational research pathway. So this is a technology that's a simple phenocam that we've been you know, developing its application for you know, five or six years now um, to basically train um, on the edge computing of images of corn and soybean plants. Now we're working in cotton as well to be able to detect when that crop is undergoing water stress and when that water stress is, uh, you know, mitigated, right? Whether that's, you know, we often see with crops early in the morning, they're, they're, they're not water stressed. If in the peak of the day, if they are going to be experiencing water stress, they start to exhibit those um, symptoms. And then later in the day when it cools, they start to perk back up. So quantifying the, the time and the duration of that can be helpful in understanding drought stress. But then this could be operationalized to be used to inform irrigation technology, to map what's going on in the fields. We can put this technology, as well as the other technologies just I highlighted, and mount this on tractors. So that as tractors are driving across the field, we can continuously monitor and map what's going on in the fields, um, or in some cases, drones. So hopefully, uh, Paula will, will spend more time in depth talking about that. And that is everything. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Stephen. And I'm, we're actually not doing questions. So we are going to move right into the next one. And Stephen, I love all this optimism. Uh, it's really inspirational to see all of the cool opportunities for tech and organic and what's already happening in the field. I also love all the chat questions and comments. Keep them coming because these are all part of the ag tech discussion, both the potentials and the pitfalls. And we're going to be focusing on some tech um, drawbacks later today, but we thought we'd start on a positive note. Um, and that leads us to our next talk, uh, where we'll hear about the use of smart technologies and their opportunities in organic from Dr. Andrew Hammermeister. Um, Dr. Hammermeister is the director of the Organic Agriculture Center of Canada and associate professor in the Faculty of Agriculture at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada. He's also the science director for the Organic Science Cluster, which is a coordinated national initiative for organic agricultural research in Canada. Um, he sits on the National Organic Standards Review Committee and several other organic center, uh, sector committees. So I'll pass it over to you, Andy. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, can you just confirm that you're everybody's seeing what they need to see? Yes. Are we good? Okay, great. Thank you very much. It's such an opportunity. Uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And you know, this issue of technology and agriculture is, is very fascinating. And often when I'm talking with conventional farmers or with uh, government policymakers, often what uh, they're suggesting is that organic is very traditional, it's old practices. And um, it really prompted me to think about uh, what the new technologies are in agriculture and, and how we might apply them. And Kathleen and Stephen have already done a great job of introducing some of this as well. And I'll be taking a little bit bigger picture look at some of the opportunities. So let's start by reflecting on the iPhones uh, uh, principles and organic 3.0. And so I think we need to always kind of come back to this, that we want to focus on the principles of health, ecology, fairness, and care. I'm particularly intrigued by the chat that's going on. There's a lot of discussion that would relate to the principle of fairness around this technology. I mostly will be thinking more about ecology and care, perhaps, and, and, and linking to health as well throughout this presentation. I also want to link to Organic 3.0, which is the next stage in the evolution of organic agriculture that has been developed by the international movement. So uh, there's six features of Organic 3.0. The top two relate to a culture of innovation, uh, continuous innovation, and continuous improvement toward best practice. And so when I think about smart technologies and, and agriculture, I, I think about these first two features and how we might connect with them. So what is smart agriculture? And a lot of people are confused. There's various terms. There's um, uh, agriculture 4.0, smart farming, a lot of different terms that are out there. I like to describe smart agriculture as farming, uh, smart farming leveraging advanced technologies for observing, tracking, monitoring, automating and analyzing operations. So this is a lot of the computer and digital technologies that Stephen was just talking about. But it could, includes a wide variety of combinations of sensors, computing systems, automated equipment, big data, the cloud, and the internet of things. So let's take a look at that a little bit more closely. If I think about the components of a smart agricultural system, Usually we have some part of the agro ecosystem that we're looking at. It could be the soil, the crops, or livestock, either together or independently. So a smart agricultural system uh, includes several components. The first one is some sort of a sensor that's looking at the ecosystem or the subject, which could be plants or animals. That sensor is gathering information, gathering data, but it has to transmit that information over to some sort of a platform that can actually use it and analyze it. And Stephen has been talking about that quite a bit in his presentation. So in that, um, as a data gets transferred to computing systems, that's where data analysis happens. You have programs and software, they're analyzing that information and producing some kind of an output. Maybe it's a decision or a recommendation or an action. Those in a fully automated system, you would have those instructions uh, or from that analytical process being sent back out to actionable tools, which could be robotics, and those tools would act back on to the ecosystem. So now that doesn't mean that the farmer themselves is completely excluded from the smart agriculture system. We could be gathering data, having the analytical system go to work, and then the farmer could make the decision that sends the information back to the robot, or the farmer might make a decision that uh, sends out information to their um, farm crew and they act on the ecosystem. But more recently, we've also seen that uh, um, smart agriculture can include data transmission to huge data storage centers. And you're seeing more and more of this in conventional agriculture, especially where uh, you have huge storages of information. And the information that's being gathered from one individual's farm might be transmitted to this data storage that can then be linked to your data system at your house, for example but it also might integrate data from other sources. So a big data network. And um, so that's kind of really interesting in terms of the big data concept. 
So why are we using uh, smart agriculture? What are our goals? And ultimately, we are trying to capture improved profitability, productivity, efficiency, um, perhaps environmental performance. And there's many different ways of doing this, You're reducing labor and inputs and uh, reducing costs, enhancing yields, more precise management, and so on. So let's take a look at some examples. I'm going to start with field scale sensing and mapping uh, for precision management. And really, the goal here is about looking, mapping whole fields and understanding what's going on in terms of the, uh, the soil and the crops and figuring out how we should manage it appropriately. I feel that in organic agriculture, because of our ecological context, the more information that we have about the environment that we're growing in, the better off we are. If we better understand the plants and their physiology or the other organisms that are there, pests or beneficials, and the soil especially, the more information we have about it, the better off we are and the more precise our management can be. So there are some new systems such as uh, this Toyota uh, system is uh, looking at developing real-time um, sensing and soil mapping equipment that you can tie onto the back of a tractor. And so this uh, particular unit can identify or analyze the soil for about 30 different soil properties as it's moving through the field. So you can get really detailed maps of different soil properties. Now, this isn't something that uh, the average farmer is going to have access to, um, but eventually we might, perhaps 10, 15, 20 years down the road, we might be starting to see this kind of information becoming available to farmers more readily, where um, the service providers might have these tools that can provide uh, very precise maps of your fields and allow you to have precision management on them. Uh, many farmers uh, that are grain farmers are now looking at uh, equipment like yield monitors. And again, yield monitors have sensors. They have moisture sensors and a way of various ways of detecting the actual yield of the crop that's coming in. It uh, has global positioning systems and this data retrieving and analytical center and then a monitor that puts output out. And I think that the yield uh, monitor you know, it can provide a nice map. And a lot of farmers just say, well, it produces a nice map. What do we do with it next? And, but I think for us as producers, understanding where our yield is coming from is really important. We can uh, optimize our management towards uh, addressing problem areas or supporting the areas that have high productivity. We also, as we remove crop from the field, um, we're also removing nutrients. And in organic farming, we need to ensure that we're replacing the nutrients that we remove. Sometimes we neglect that. And it's very important that we acknowledge that as we remove crop, we need to replace those nutrients as well. So let's take a look at remote sensing. And remote sensing is basically uh, sensing things from a distance. And as Stephen was kind of hinting at, we've got drones and uh, planes and satellites that could all be sensing different wavelengths of radiation being reflected back off of surfaces like the soil, plants, water, pavement, and, and whatnot. Um, and the different sensors can detect different wavelengths of information. And that information can be used to help support, uh, identify whether plants are healthy or not, um, the structure of the plants, and uh, perhaps nutrient deficiencies, water deficits, and so on. So here's an example um, from a vineyard where um, various uh, remote sensing data has been collected in various wavelengths to support um, uh, identification of stressors in the plant uh, so you could identify diseases. Um, perhaps you're looking at overall productivity of the vineyard. Um, you also might be identifying water uh, and irrigation issues. So if you see plants that are under water stress, um, there's various um, uh, wavelengths of light that you can measure, use to measure water stress in your crops as well. So many, many tools that can help us to optimize our management. So why is this important? It's be important because often these wavelengths of light, um, uh, these sensors can detect things that we cannot detect with our own eyes. And sometimes the fields are too big for us to walk and scout appropriately. And, and so it allows us to be more proactive in our management 
to prevent diseases and ensure that the plant growth is being optimized so that we are more resistant to diseases and more resilient to other stressors. So it's, I think in organic more than in conventional, we really need to understand what's going on with our plants so that we can be proactively managing to optimize their health. So if we look at uh, precision agriculture um, technologies, uh, Stephen went through a number of these very nicely in more detail than I will, but there's a lot of different uh, weed management technologies that are becoming available. Um, we're seeing more and more in Canada, a lot of these camera guided weeding systems uh, that are, and I'm sure in the US as well, um, and inter-row cultivation between small grain cereals and whatnot uh, are being adopted. So certainly we have these cameras that are detecting where plants, uh, plant rows are and you're weeding around the, your actual crop, which is, uh, uh, allows for much more precise mechanical control. Um, Stephen gave some great examples of robotic weeders, so I won't dwell on it too much. I think that this is a, a new evolution in weeding. And he also talked about deep learning and artificial intelligence, so where we're training um, cameras and software to actually be able to identify different types of weeds, or and not just weeds, different types of plants. And this is important. So this photo shows perhaps a, a spray being tar targeting a weed, which is really important. But you can also flip this around and imagine um, uh, targeting your crop with a particular biological, biostimulant, maybe a foliar application um, or uh, some other nutrient. So you can not only use this as a spray to control things, but also as a spray to um, support your crop in other ways. And uh, again, as Stephen mentioned, we can, because of the cost of organic inputs, we could, by per applying more precisely, we can reduce our costs and our efficiency. Um, this robot was kind of interesting to me because it's uh, solar powered and it is um, it has the capacity to identify weeds and target them for spraying as uh, on one hand, but it can also identify the weeds. So if the spray won't work, then it will actually send out a little hoe that you can see there on the photo and actually mechanically remove the weed. So obviously this is a little bit smaller scale and not the um, field scale production systems. Stephen also hinted at um, uh, harvesting systems and ro robotic harvesting. And this is, I think, even more important for organic farming because we want to ensure that we're um, de harvesting fruits when they're at their optimum for harvest and storage and transport and so on. We have to have fruits that are resilient uh, to because we cannot use a lot of the inputs to protect the crop that are otherwise available to the conventional industry. So by optimizing the timing of harvest um, and ensuring that we're picking only good quality fruit so you don't have a spoilage risk, um, we're uh, hopefully uh, having much more sustainable fruit production. I think pest forecasting is another big one. In organic, uh, we need to be able to understand pest cycles and use uh, weather stations and all of the climate sensing technologies and the models that are associated with that to better understand when pests are going to be a problem and so that we can optimize the timing of our pest control uh, of procedures. And there's various technologies that are integrating all of these different sensing equipment and making recommendations now. So it's, it's really interesting time. Uh, this is research that's uh, being done in uh, Quebec actually. And uh, as many might be familiar, the trichogramma wasp is um, a a predator of the European corn borer. And usually it's hard to get enough wasps in a cornfield to actually control the, uh, the corn borer. So in this case, the Quebec researchers have developed these pellets where they put the eggs into the pellets and then they deliver the pellets in a nice grid-wise fashion in the field so that the trichogramma wasps, when they hatch, they're distributed evenly throughout the entire cornfield. And so thus you have much more effective biological control. So another example of uh, how technology can be used. We're also seeing um, the uh, many more apps on phones that are allowing us to identify weeds, diseases, insects, uh, and uh, the level of disease or, or problem that we're investigating. The sooner we can identify problems, the better off we are for in agriculture, especially in organic, uh, for managing them. 
This one I found really interesting. The, there's a leaf here in this little jar. It's a, either a potato or a tomato leaf. And they basically close the, the leaf inside the jar. And a special um, unit has been attached to the cell phone and software. And after the leaf has been in the jar for 10 minutes, um, it actually the disease Phytophthora infestans or late blight is releasing certain um, volatile organic compounds into the jar. And that little straw is sucking in those compounds and can be serve as an early warning detection system of late blight incidents, which allows perhaps more earlier and more effective control. I also want to talk briefly about livestock management because in livestock, we want to ensure and optimize the health of our livestock. And so um, optimizing the environment that they're growing in or living in is one thing, but we also want to monitor the animals uh, for their, to make sure that they're not under stress. And there's so many different uh, sensing technologies available now in terms of measuring body heat of animals, their movement, um, their gas emissions, uh, uh, even uh, sounds that the animals might be making within the barn. So if the animals are in distress or coughing, um, uh, the automated systems can start to pick up those sounds and actually notify the producer so that they can be dealing with problems because before they get to be really big. Now, these sorts of technologies, I keep imagining them being uh, available to outdoor situations as well. But, um, but certainly, I think if we want to be proactive about health and welfare in livestock and organic, then we should be looking at some of these technologies. Um, I was interested in this. The Alibaba group um, has a whole system of smart ag technologies that they're using in their swine operations. And I, I found this one really interesting because among all of the technologies they're using, there's one that they, they use for tracking the movement of the animals. So basically they're exercise tracking and um, perhaps a sign of things to come. So if you look at the, the, the text on the side, um, it says the system can even ensure that the piglets are not just alive, but they're healthy too. It automatically charts a workout regimen for the hogs on a daily basis and tracks their running distance, duration, and speed. Pigs that have not fulfilled their daily exercise target will be singled out and deprived of the right to rest until they meet the minimum running distance. So, so they're depriving them until they get their exercise. Um, more of us should probably be so in, uh, motivated. We want a pig that can run 200 kilometers instead of weighing 200 kilograms, says the president of Alibaba Cloud. It is the pig's exercise volume that is shaping up to be the new standard for pork quality. So really interesting, uh, different approach. Lastly, I, in terms of livestock, and uh, we talked about robotic milkers briefly in previous presentations, but um, what I find really fascinating, aside from just having robotic milkers, instead of having the cows waste time and energy walking back to the barn, uh, Wagenhagen has now developed robot, a robotic milker that will follow the cows around out in the field. So as the herd moves, the robotic milker will move and automatically milk the cows in the field. And then the farmer will go out with the service wagon and collect the milk um, every day. So really interesting opportunities there. So in conclusion, I think that smart agriculture has many, many opportunities. And there's obviously many drawbacks. A lot of this technology is really expensive. And sometimes it might be scale dependent if you want to really make it efficient. But I think there's opportunities perhaps in the ag sector to have advising or consulting groups or perhaps cooperatives working together in using some of these uh, technologies so that we can apply them appropriately. Some of the concerns I have um, uh, that have been expressed are, you know, if we get into robotics and some of these sensing systems, yes, we can see things or especially robotic systems. Will that mean that farmers are in the field less and will they be observing um, the crop less and the soil? Will they become less connected if you just have a robotic tractor going out into the field? So is there that connection with the landscape and what's going on out there? So there are other philosophical issues, but certainly I think that there's some clear potential for applications that could make organic better. So with that, I really appreciate um, the opportunity and look forward to the breakout sessions for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, Yes, I wish we had more time for discussion after each of these talks. And also, I'm 
I echo Jessica's excitement in the very active chat box. So please um, stay engaged with that. I appreciate any of the speakers who can respond to some of the questions and comments. Um, so we'll sort of have a little discussion in that sense, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but in the meantime, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Revathi Kolegala is an ethical technologist and a commons governance researcher. She has a master of science in electrical engineering. And currently as the executive director of the Region Foundation, Revathi is a pioneer in the field of technology that supports global grassroots food systems. Um, she is a technology mentor for Siwa Cooperative Federation, and she supports the agricultural cooperatives of indigenous women in India and co-leads a research network that is currently exploring responsible AI or artificial intelligence governance to help create more inclusive data communities. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. I'm just gonna share my screen, uh, starting with this, because this is the question I get asked the most. How do you pronounce my name? Um, well, it's, uh, it's Ravati, but you can also call me Rave. And, and, and uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm the executive director of Region Foundation. I'm also a technology mentor for Seva Cooperative Federation. So I bring a little bit of each of that to the discussion here. Um, and I wanna share a little bit of that and how that influences my values and perspectives in this particular topic as we talk about ag tech and the confluence with organic. Um, Seva Cooperative Federation is uh, arguably the largest federation of uh, women's cooperatives in the informal economy, and I am a tech technology mentor there, and that includes the responsible AI governance that was just mentioned um, with indigenous communities in India. And a big part of that is sort of looking at how digitization and tech can be applicable to these women applicable, right? Uh, at Region Foundation, it is a nonprofit uh, that's part of the larger region network, which aligns ecology with economy. Uh, that includes uh, eco credits, which allows financing uh, as one means of support for uh, regenerative activities, including land regeneration, and that includes organic agriculture. Um, so while both of these hats, when I look at all the different conversations with about ag tech and about organic, uh, and this is probably a lot of your experiences too, there are all these terms thrown around, right? We talk about it in terms of accessibility and equity and all of that. Even from the previous speakers, uh, this, there's a, an aura of innovation, there's an aura of novelty there's also as much a skepticism of uh, a lot can go wrong and there are a lot of challenges there. And, you know, very practical perspective, uh, looking at, you know, uh, not the big farms, but the 60 to 70% of the farmers across the world who would adopt organic agriculture. Some of the main challenges I've seen is just money and inequity. And that's also true for ag tech. And I see that as, as, as sort of a, a very clear pattern, right? So when you think about money, I mean, we know how um, it's, uh, it sort of takes effort. It's non-trivial to, to adopt ag tech tools. It's also non-trivial to, um, to even adopt organic practices. The default might be to not do that, right? Um, we looked at all the robotic milking farms and so on. I mean, of course, all of that is gonna come with some amount of uh, maybe upfront capital if you're adopting regenerative practices like a lot of the women um, do in these indigenous communities. Um, it, it takes more than what their livelihood can right now sustain for some of the practices. 
if that's, for instance, rainwater harvestation and so on and so forth, uh, as, as some examples are uh, organic fertilizers that they produce within their community. So it takes effort, right? And through these talks today, you'll also see some of the solutions for this. If the answer is money, then um, you'll find Stephen talking about federal financing that's available. And from the corner of the world where I said, uh, Region Foundation also enables uh, regenerative financing, which is financing for sustainable practices, and that includes organic agriculture. And uh, there are a bunch of others also in the ecosystem where you'll find financing, right? So, so uh, there is there's some part of the solution to that if we say that ag tech it goes along with organic and we want to overcome these challenges. The other aspect that we've heard a lot and we'll probably hear a lot more today about as well is inequity. Um, and to me, it comes in various forms. And just, just personally, this is really important to me. Um, I was born in India and I lived in the US for a lot of my time. Uh, so coming back to India, I'm really aware of how digital access is not the same for farmers and others. The size of the land makes a huge difference. What you can use for a big farm, you cannot adapt for small landholders and that's 60 to 70% in the world. And as has been repeated multiple times, a lot of these are not really designed where farmers are at the forefront of all these tools and technologies. And to me, that's the disconnect here. And that's, those are some of the challenges that need to be overcome. I feel organic and sustainability is a movement, right? It's personal to, uh, to the farmer, the, and it's their connection to the land, they're tilling the soil they walk on. And it's people-led, it's farmer-led, it's land steward-led. But the technology and ag tech, a lot of the times does not reflect that. It's you have the central node um, where people create tech and then that's adopted out uh, into farmers or farming communities. Whereas really where we need to move towards is everything works together and it's co-created. And, and that's really the vision that I wanna see and I wanna help bring alive where we are able to translate these movements into digital communities and uh, ag tech tools. And specifically in the corner that we are in, in Region Foundation, in how this can influence sort of concrete uh, eco credits and methodologies that dictate how farmers get uh, you know, compensated for uh, regenerative practices. And uh, part of what we steward is uh, to, to make this happen is in the technology space that we are in and the way that this is implemented, 30% of what would be the equivalent of shares, but in digital form uh, as crypto tokens are set aside specifically for communities to participate in designing these methodologies to dictate how, uh, what really goes into deciding uh, how regenerative financing is distributed. And so, and this happens on chain, which means it happens uh, via technology, it happens in a distributed manner, which means there is more of an even ground for everybody, including farmers to have a say uh, and be able to design these methods and these tools, which would be uh, how they can finance organic agriculture or um, that they wanna see uh, helping and supporting them. The other option also is as uh, a nonprofit, we are, uh, we have a member consortium and 5% of the shares and the equivalent crypto tokens are uh, sort of the purview of the consortium. So we follow the consortium's um, sort of priorities and so on. So if a farming community were to be a member of the consortium, they would have a say in how, uh, how the foundation would vote 
or help design or participate to help bring some of these projects alive, which might help more regenerative financing. And I want to end with a pitch and say um, that I do believe that organic is important, sustainability is important, and it's important that we take an active stance in designing it and um, and that comes with its responsibilities. And I invite you all to, to really be part of the movement and, and join Region Foundation, whether it is to benefit from the 30% as tokens, which includes um, sort of income over time uh, in the form of staking rewards, sort of like endowments, uh, or as a member of our consortium. Um, we work very closely with a lot of other communities that you'll see here, including Open Team and so on. And Open Team is uh, also one of the communities that we are bringing on board. Uh, and we're very eager to make sure that land stewards have their say in the ecosystem to create sort of this global ecological ledger, which can make organic accessible and ag tech really participatory. And that's all I had. Thank you so much, Rave. That was fantastic. And we're going to kind of um, follow along the lines um, of funding here because we're going to hear from Dr. Stephen Thompson, a national program leader with the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Prior to joining NEPA, he was an associate professor at Virginia Tech where he received the Alpha Epsilon Award for his research and extension program and an outstanding faculty award in the BSE department, um, primarily for instruction. He was also lead scientist with the USDA ARS, and he'll be talking about funding opportunities for develop developing organic focused ag tech. Um, a lot of current ag tech focuses on conventional systems because that's where companies can make money. So he's going to cover some of the federal programs that are available to those interested in focusing on organic. So I will pass it over to you, Steve. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll have to apologize. I'll have to leave right after this uh, presentation because I'm at the University of Maryland and uh, they have a tight schedule for me. But uh, my, I did, or my agency had funded this conference, by the way. And so we're very happy to have done that. Uh, so I will share the screen and see, I have one monitor here and I'm not used to it. So we'll see what happens. Well, that's not what I want. Okay, it's coming, I promise. All right. Great, okay. Everybody see it? Okay. So I'm going to, this will be of some interest to, this will be of interest to some of you. Um, but I was lurking in the background while we were eating lunch back here and I heard some really interesting presentations. I've been, uh, I've been saving the chat along the way and a lot of the comments that have been made on uh, Program uh, programming uh, for uh, applicability to small farms really hits home. So I'm going to talk about some of these aspects, and 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 some of your feedback will help us uh, develop or modify programs we already have. So I'll get right into it. All right, Washington D.C. update. Uh, you all know that Tom Vilsack is back as Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, the AI initiatives that were developed uh, in the last administration have been continuing. And there's more of an emphasis on, I say climate change. I like to call it climate smart agriculture and rural revitalization. New NIFA director is uh, fairly new, uh, Dr. Carrie Castile. And uh, she has a pretty extensive extension background in addition to what you see here. The state of NIFA, as you know, uh, we moved from the DC area to, or may know, to Kansas City area. We lost 78% of our workforce. So many of us were doing double and triple duty. Uh, I was acting division director for nine months and also doing program leader work. But we're back, but we had funding, we had authority to hire. So we're back up to about 85% capacity in a rapid 
period of time. Uh, but everybody's been teleworking and nobody is, none of the new people have met each other in person, which is pretty bizarre. Uh, the awards management division has been getting the grants out pretty fast, the new, the new group. So we're really happy about the way things are going. Uh, those of you who know about our funding agency, we fund about half and half capacity grants, which is money that goes to the university. Uh, and part of that money is used for faculty salaries also. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a few competitive grants, a uh, grant programs that can, that are applicable to organic, organic agriculture. All right, the first one many of you know about, Matt Negotiel runs this one, it's the OREI program. I want to give you some stats on it. Um, got about $25 million uh, fund in funding in total. The funding rate's higher than many of the programs we have, and if a 26% is on the high side, which is, is very good. Priorities listed based on both legislative priorities and stakeholder input. And uh, I really, like I say, I really like the comments that have come out this morning. What I, I mean, I'm really happy to, to have been able to snatch those and save them locally. I'm gonna show Matt and see what he thinks. Um, okay, organic systems field work must be done on certified organic land, but there are some special cases. And then if, if you have animal agriculture and you're, you're doing some comparisons with uh, conventional agriculture, there's some leeway on that, but I, I don't know, uh, you can talk to Matt about it. But funding levels vary a lot. There's many different uh, levels of funding for this program, unusually high compared to some of the other programs. I want to turn your attention to this program, though, uh, the small and medium-sized farms program. And we do get organic agriculture uh, proposals in this one, not as many as I'd like to see, but most of these proposals are integrated. What that means, which is good, which means uh, they are research proposals with at least one of the other two areas, uh, extension and education. Funding rate is really good on this one, 30%. Uh, and I would, you know, and, and, and this is where, uh, say, low-level technologies, uh, proposals with lower-level technologies that may have been synthesized from larger um, ones can find their home. And so uh, this is a very good program. Uh, I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. Uh, I've got some stats here. Uh, oh, for the period of 2014 to 2020, we had um, 307 applications, and there they, and there's the total funding that you see there, requested and awarded. Uh, you can see the distribution of these grants. Pretty good distribution. The middle uh, arid areas of the U.S. don't have as many, but a lot of them are, it's pretty evenly distributed on the eastern half, I should say. Many of them going to Alabama and went down there. Another program is called the CARE program. And this is where applied research and extension is very much an extension-based program. This is where the applications are expected to produce results that can be rapidly adopted by end users. It's $300,000 per grant. This is one I'm really excited about. I don't run it, but occasionally I help uh, in management of this one. And so um, definitely look, look for this one. I think Jim Dobrowalski is the lead on this. And we have more, we have new in program leaders involved also. Small business innovation research. I don't want to single out any particular one because there are at least two programs that could apply to organic agriculture. There's a 15% funding rate across the board. And I like that model because it doesn't matter how many proposals come in. My program's the engineering one. It gets the most application, but that means we get the most money. <laughs> 
because it's 15%. And you've got two levels. Once it's the first level has gone up from 100K to 175K for eight months, and that's extendable. Sometimes you can't get it all done in eight months. And then 650K for phase two. We have technical and business assistance, uh, and that's an additional additional fee. Or you can, and but you must be registered in SAMS, SBIR, and have a DUNS number. You have to get that all out of the way. So um, our point person is Melinda Kaufman. She can tell you all the procedurals on this. And that's all I have. I went eight minutes. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to be here and. I may lurk around as I can to uh, absorb some of the important presentations here. And thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, always good to know about the opportunities for federal funding. So now we're gonna go ahead and have some breakout groups to discuss any thoughts that have arisen from these talks. Um, everyone's gonna have 20 minutes in a breakout group which you will automatically be placed in with one of these moderators. And can we get the slide up with the moderators? I think there is one. Here we go. So we have Kathleen Merrigan, the executive director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University. Um, Danny Nuremberg, president of Food Tank. Greg Ostick, co-founder of RSI and active member of Open Team. Mark Squire, president of Good Earth Natural Foods. Um, Jeff Shazansky, NCAT agriculture and natural resource economist, um, Su Summer Sullivan, a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Christy Sun, a professor in the Department of Viticulture and Enology at California State University, Fresno, um, and Anil Shrestha, a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at California State University, Fresno, and then Amber and me. Um, so you don't have to click any buttons or anything. We'll just send you right into the breakout rooms. And then 20 minutes later, you will come back to the main group. Um, so here are the questions that will help guide the discussion. Um, if you go to the next slide, they are there we go. Um, so your moderator is going to either take notes themselves or ask someone to take notes. And then we'll do a really quick report back to the full group after we reconvene. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry if the getting kicked out was a little bit abrupt. Um, we are going to do super fast report backs of the top line discussion items. Um, please share notes afterwards because everyone has one to two minutes to give report outs. Um, and Libby, if you don't mind going back to the slide um, with each of the group moderators, I'll use that. Um, I'll go first, just as an example of how to do this really fast. So some of the things that we talked about um, are the need for tools for measuring soil health to shift the conversation around measuring outcomes rather than just process-based 
um, for organic, uh, the needs for selective herbicide, and a challenge that tech hasn't been perfected yet. A lot of what gets discussed hasn't been perfected. Um, there was also discussion around what organic needs to do to make it more accept to make um, to make tech for organic more usable. And there was there are the, these two perspectives. One is that organic really needs to be present at the table because if organic's not at the table, we can't inform our what our tech needs are. And then there's this other perspective that yes, but money drives research. So even if we're at the table, are we going to make an impact? Um, when the technology is going to follow the money. And then the last thing that was discussed is giving farmers data is great, but what is the farmer going to do with that data? Um, is the data actually usable? So those were our topics. And Amber, I'll go ahead and pass it to you next. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Um... I'm not sure that I can like summarize so eloquently. Um, <laughs> we kind of were all over the board, which is fantastic. Um, so I think I can just highlight a couple points that came up. We discussed how um, technology in some cases is really necessary in order for farmers to remain competitive in their markets, um, whether that's domestic or international. Um, there are some benefits, like we see, you know, we see advantages of using technology across scales, whether it's from our gardens or to uh, larger scale farms. Um, but that also can come with some drawbacks, such as like, you know, upfront costs of investment um, that can cause debt that then has to be, um, you know, relieved or made up for in, in their profitability. There was an interesting comment about farmers from the past green revolution and how there's this big reliance on um, chemical tools. It's just almost like the way that we think about farming and the idea that the future might not look like that anymore, um, that we might not be using chemicals as the main tool or as the main crutch and might just be thinking more creatively to work around that and how technology will be involved in that process. And then we talked a bit about scale and how there seems to be this tension and scale th through all of these um, topics and conversation and how a lot of, um, well, basically how organic encompasses the entire range of scales of operations and how some of these larger crops like corn and soy and cotton um, could really utilize some of these tools that were discussed earlier today and how um, we do need a larger domestic supply of these crops. Um, but we also have this um, idea of organic, especially consumers being small scale diversified and how do we also support that with technology? So I'll just leave it at that. That's great. Greg, do you want to report out? I'll try. Um, so the first question was what are opportunities and challenges of ag tech moving organic forward? Um, some folks um, talked about that it's very productivity focused at the moment um, and that that probably isn't the best um, focus. ROI is maybe a better focus, um, agro, other, other sort of um, uh, agroeconomic like systems should be the focus rather than just productivity because productivity hasn't historically shown to yield better lives for farmers or for land stewards. Um, we also talked about like the traceability of inputs and traceability documentation in general is sort of what connects organic. So that's a clear area where ag tech could benefit all of organic. A lot of the other ag tech is very specific to a, a given crop. Um, so if you want to benefit organic generally, uh, focusing on traceability and that supply chain elements and re reducing the effort and, and, you know, entering data once used many times seems like a lot of bang for your buck. And then um, in the end, this, I'll just say that the statement is we all want our Star Trek future, but we don't want it to suck. Some of what we're seeing doesn't feel awesome. So we like tech, but let's make it cool. That's a great quote, Greg. Thanks for sharing. It's from I, Ikeda, so you can quote her. Yeah, you know. I can hear her saying that. All right, Kathleen. Sure. Um, so there was the observation that a lot of the chat 
during our plenary seemed to be a negative take on technology altogether and that we need to get to a more calibrated uh, discussion. Um, there was discussion about what it meant at uh, um, the farm ranch level and the potential of technology taking some of the drudgery out of farming um, and also advancing it, the excitement over, for example, harvesting fruit at a perfect time, the technology that helps with that. We talked about robotic milkers, robotic weeders, um, a lengthy conversation um, shared on where the NOSB is on all of this and feeling that sometimes that um, committee gets locked in time, status quo focused, and maybe missing some opportunities. One that was raised was, for example, taking allergens from self shellfish, um, looking at natural sources of phosphorus. Um, we talked about the OTA ASU workshops and how some of those issues may come up. We had a participant in our, um, our work group from Nigeria and talking about a lot of these technologies cost is going to be the, the key thing that is make or break in Nigeria. But then we also talked about how that's also true in the US, who wins and loses in these technologies. How could um, government help support the smaller guys adoption of these technologies? And uh, one of our participants made it very clear that there is a lot of private capital out there for individual farmers and ranchers because a lot of the people in charge of that capital are very pro-technology and want to make uh, technology accessible. That's my summary, high level. That's great. Um, Danny, you want to go ahead? Yeah, and I want to thank Jason from Quick Organics for taking such awesome notes. So we only got to a few of the questions. On the challenges side, uh, we talked about making technology uh, you know, ease the, the paperwork uh, problem that many farmers have for organic certification and renewals and, and for certifiers to really, you know, the technology isn't at a point where it can make this easier for farmers. We, we need technology that also solves real world problems that is um, developed alongside farmers uh, in a more, more participatory way so that it can solve the problems that actually need solving. Farmers need um, better cost benefit analysis so that they know, uh, you know, how much a new technology will cost and, 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 and whether it's useful to them. Um, there's a lot of variability, especially around soil. So blanket uh, applications uh, from that technology advises doesn't always make a lot of sense. On, on the um, strategy side, there was a talk uh, that I found really interesting about using different language. So, you know, instead of robots talking about smaller technologies that farmers, you know, can actually use and, and don't find so sort of maybe offensive or, or um, you know, make them uncomfortable. And then we talked about, you know, maybe there's ways to change the semantics and the vocabulary around how we talk about technologies. Um, uh, because it, you know, again, could help with adoption. Um, uh, promoting technologies based on what they do and the benefits they provide rather than what the technology actually is. It could be a strategy to help farmers. And then, of course, keeping things cost effective and making sure that, that farmers um, who so many of we heard, you know, during the, the plenary session, how they're 60 to 70 percent of the farmers around the world are small farmers. How can we make it easier for them to adopt um, technologies that can help them but don't raise the price for them? Um, and we also talked about different kinds of business models that, you know, there there are ways to make this, again, cost effective for farmers, but aren't sort of Silicon Valley based uh, business models. I think I will end there. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff, your two minute summary. All right. Um, it was interesting. We had a number of people, and I, despite my conjoling, only the farmers talked, which was unusual because usually the farmers don't, <laughs> in my experience. Anyway, um, so one was how to data. You can have a lot of data, but how to translate it into actionable things is what people find. You know, there's a lot of these things will give you a lot of data, but it doesn't give you the next step on then what to do with it. That was a big one. Um, staffing, um, you know, if you have a larger farm, which one of these farmers is a fairly large farm, 
I think both of them are pretty large farms actually. And it was, you know, that having competent staff that can actually utilize the software. You know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a, you have to learn. You have to learn how to use this stuff. As I know, as an old person, I don't do very well. Um, and also that, that there is some, that some of the advantage of time saving is kind of critical because as we all know, lots of farmers, uh, you know, are having mental health issues and have, are overworked and don't have vacations, don't see their children, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if this can lower time that they have to be going so they have time to spend with the other, then maybe mental health will be improved. One of the positive outcomes of, 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 of technology. Um, again, another thing about the massive data and the insights, how do you use it? And the, interestingly, the farmer that was with us was using software I hadn't heard of, but it's called Azure by Microsoft. I probably shouldn't say a trade name, but anyway. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, they, they had other software to collect production information, other software to collect financial information. Then, th th then they had to bring that together. And it sounds like a really big investment. And I, when I asked, do you think it's paying off production or economic wise? He said, give me a year and a half, I don't know yet. <laughs> so, so sometimes, which makes you think, and that came up too, is um, you know, understanding the cost of the investment, will it return? You know, in other words, it's a lot of it in investment and it's very hard to know like a robot, if will it break down a lot? Will it actually function well? And until you use it, you don't know how to, for instance, depreciate it. Will it only last 10 years? Will it only five years? How much do you have to, so you can't get a good sense of how much is contributing to the bottom line. That's it. All right, great. Anil. Uh, we have uh, some points. Some of them are overlap of whatever uh, has been discussed already by the other moderators. So um, we discussed that, you know, the lack of understanding what ag tech in itself is, is a big issue and the utility these uh, many of these tools generate nice looking maps but uh, we don't really know what to do with those information and the lack of communication that there is an understanding that organic and these ag tech uh, do not go hand in hand so there needs to be proper communication around that uh, cost again was discussed uh, as other moderators this did and risk in adoption so we don't really know or communicate much on uh, what the risks are in adoption of these technologies and then um, the point came up that uh, this itself is a learning process on top of whatever we already have and it's just an overwhelming experience to have to uh, learn all these new technologies. And the point came up that uh, systems are not quite automated enough. Uh, there still needs to be uh, more work done to make these user friendly. And there is a great deal of skepticism on who's benefiting from all this. And uh, also uh, farmers are generally not involved in um, development of these technologies, these technologies are brought to them. And even though they have uh, a great deal of knowledge in these systems, uh, whatever they need, the technology, they should be involved in that. And um, uh, one of the speakers said, you know, the question of how can we have them adopt the technology in itself is wrong. So uh, we should have them in a participatory mode. And um, the energy costs, again, around these technologies is not cheap. So it, there is energy involved. And again, um, yeah, so uh, user friendliness and um, yes, the, the, the uh, yeah, the last point we need, we need more case studies to demonstrate the utility of these technologies. So that was kind of an overview of what we discussed. Yeah, that's great. Mark, do you want to go ahead and report out? Yeah, so um, you know, our group talked a lot about the capital costs to like who's going to pay for it and um, you know how how it's compensated back. Um, and I think you know our group sort of looked a little bit at the uh, you know 
I think everybody sort of agreed that organic wasn't really the distinct uh, the distinguishing factor of what would drive the technology, but rather uh, crop crops in itself, or uh, um, you know, also scale of the operations. And uh, it was mentioned that we should be really looking at agriculture technology generally, and organic should be sort of picking and choosing. The pieces of that that worked for us uh, as a group. Um, there was a. It seemed like we we you know concentrated more a little bit on uh, weeds uh, and cultivation systems when in in our conversation, and there was a um, um, little bit of conversation about who should do the testing. Um, you know, one of our uh, farmer members had uh, tested, done some testing of robotic weeding. And uh, the term that was used was it's pretty crude at this point. And um, so there was a little bit of discussion about what the farmer's role should be in developing. And, um, you know, it was actually me that made the point of that farmers are, you know, stressed anyway, in terms of uh, their, their labor and uh, their time and therefore they should not be taking the brunt of being the testers. In other words, farmers need tools that are actually functional working. Um, and um, yeah, and then there was also sort of a um, comment that, you know, in the investment in these technologies, we should really be like driving the government, you know, governmental support toward um, solutions that help you know greater environmental so, you know create environmental solutions rather than just a, a purely profit motive of uh, you know creating efficiency in agriculture and um yeah i think that's that mostly covers it great um summer do you want to report out I do, yeah. So we talked a lot, about, you know, like people have been saying a lot of challenges, right? And one that was brought up is sort of like change management. So the capacity for change on like the human and farmer side, um, you know, and thinking about sort of the fear and uncertainty that um, like kind of pops up, um, you know, and, and how to sort of potentially, you know, ways to mitigate that or address that in really, you know, like appropriate ways. Um, and one of the challenges just reiterating is, you know, that people brought up was affordability. Um, the issue of rural connectivity, you know, access to broadband and Wi-Fi, um, and, you know, bigger questions like how to not, you know, leave folks out of these um, conversations. Um, one person brought up a really interesting point about, you know, how, how are these technologies being made, right? Like, what are the social and environmental costs of even just producing such technologies? Um, you know, another issue is like maintaining the technology, right? Like, um, and this idea of, you know, so-called digital literacy. Um, Another idea was sort of, you know, someone presented the thought that, you know, innovation, we should really work with kind of what's already out there, right? And trying to, instead of trying to produce like some sort of new sexy robot. Um, yeah, and then another person sort of asked the question, you know, like, you know, wondering about like, what is the appropriate level of technology really? Um, and do we have too much of it or too little or, you know, that, that type of question. And then also, you know, making data available. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's great. And Christy, you can go ahead and report out. Um, so uh, our group had a wonderful discussion. Uh, actually, I would like to invite our team representative to talk about uh, is uh, Brian Break. <laughs> so Brian, are you there? I'm here, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I was the rapporteur and we had many similar themes to what others have reported. Uh, soil health, uh, water conservation, quality. Uh, we see opportunities with applied ecology and system-based approaches. Uh, one thing we identified as an opportunity and a challenge both were uh, organic costs of production uh, relative to conventional costs of production and uh, supply chain disruptions right now. For example, uh, one of the one of our groups said that there's locally a like a 300% premium for organic feed grains. Um, that's been a, created by a number of factors. The challenge is, of course, that we see funding like so, like everyone else. Um, private sector is not really paying its fair share for research and development that, of technologies 
upon which it can profit. Uh, there's a bias toward a reductionist uh, approach uh, and methodology and, and toward in, input substitution in, uh, in uh, looking at um, organic systems. And private capital, private investment uh, tends to be biased towards um, proprietary technologies that lock out agroecological agri and systems approaches. So you really can't patent a system very easily. Um, access for small scale farmers was a, a recurring theme. Uh, most technology, frankly, is not scale neutral. Some of it is, but a lot of it's scale dependent. Um, and yeah, back to the, the feed grain situation, maybe it's unique, but I, I think it's actually a, a broader problem that fraud deters investment in organic farming methods and that that is something that that uh, would need a challenge that needs to be addressed. Um, so or, organic farmers are definitely using um, ag tech currently. Uh, they could use more. Um, we talked about access to capital and funding and also uh, briefly talked about and, and uh, it's not appropriate in many cases, but um, small scale farmers could potentially look at uh, production cooperatives and innovative financing uh, um, models to gain access to technology that otherwise would be out of reach for them that would not be appropriate for their scale. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about strategies, but we, we did see a gap in uh, promotion of new technologies and uh, technology transfer. Um, we think field technicians who serve organic producers need to be better trained, that there's, there's certainly a gap between all the great organic agriculture research that's going on and some of the breakthroughs we're seeing and getting that to practitioners out in the field. So um, the old models, local demonstrations, field days, um, and newer ways of information dissemination. Um, perhaps we should look at um, the technology diffusion models that have been used in the past and see if they need to be modified, if there's something different about organic farmers and the way that technology is diffused among them compared with, say, um, the rapid diffusion of biotechnology or genetic engineering. Um, so, um, and then and then we came here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right, great. Um, well, that wraps up our report out. So I'm going to hand it over to Amber to introduce Sarah as our next speaker. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, that was fantastic. I loved how there were so many unique points across all of the, the groups that were presented. Thank you so much for the moderator's um, feedback, reporting back. So we're going to start off um, our second round of speakers with Dr. Sarah, Sarah Rotz. Um, oh no, or Sarah Rose, I'm so sorry. I didn't ask how to say your last name, um, but she is, an, assist, <laughs> she is a, an assistant <laughs> professor at York University that's in Toronto, Canada in the Department of Environmental and Urban Change. Um, her academic and organizing work is grounded in environmental justice with a focus on land and food systems. Her research aims to situate political economic processes such as agri-food industrialization, financialization and policy within a lens of settler colonial patriarchy and racial capitalism. She um, also explores the consequences of all of these processes for sovereignty, justice and resistance movements more broadly. Her research is often collaborative and interdisciplinary in nature, and she has a keen interest in the ethics, politics and process of research itself, um, which I think is really interesting. She also does ongoing community-based work with various organizations and campaigns, including food and farmers associations, fossil fuel divestment, as well as climate justice and food sovereignty movements. Again, another very busy academic with us here today. Thank you so much for the work you do and for being with us. And um, you can just start whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I, uh, I'm, today I'm gonna talk a bit about some of my, my research looking at ag tech. 
uh, and issues around equity and marketization, uh, both in the context of uh, land uh, and da data itself. So um, I won't be able to, given the time, I won't be able to get into much of the detail. So if people want to um, uh, ask further questions or get the, get the full paper, just send me an email uh, and connect with me. So I just wanted to begin um, with the words of uh, uh, Professor uh, Manish Rosada when uh, myself and my colleague Ian Mosby were writing a book recently, we talked to him about the uh, framework of egg innovation. Um, he's a plant geneticist. He's doing work around sustainable agriculture kits, trying to get cheap, simple, effective uh, tools like this $2 uh, metal corn sheller into the hands of smallholder farmers, um, usually on small plots of land, um, often organic farmers, but you know sometimes not. Um, but these tools, the idea is that they can radically um, in, uh, reduce labor, in, in, improve crop health, uh, increase farm income, and, and uh, all without you know, having to adopt new seeds or technologies or inputs and things like that. So I asked him about GMOs and, and ag tech and he replied, that for the world's poorest farmers or for folks who are, don't have the capital um, and those who are sort of less entrenched in commodity agriculture, the benefits of ag tech um, have been exaggerated. Uh, he said, quote, a smallholder farmer needs, needs about 100 things more urgently than a GM seed right now. Um, and he also said uh, something that stuck with me is, is, you know, that if you start from a situation where small cell farmers are growing, you know, um, a range of crops, millet, root vegetables, and then you promote capital intensive technologies and cash crops, it's probably going to cause a lot of um, household, social, community displacement, dispossession, upheaval, a lot of uh, uh, debt, which we're seeing in a lot of uh, contexts. So I'm going to just expand on some of this some of these themes um, with some of the research that I've been doing. So first is on the production of data and technology. So I've been working with Dr. Kelly Bronson on some research around systemic bias in data production. So we found that scientific decision-making in ag tech um, occurring in both the private and the public sector clearly favors uh, the needs of farmers who are following a productivist strategy, those that are growing commodity crops on large acreages, um, typically something that we might call precision agriculture. Um, so we actually, the way that we did this analysis, um, so when we um, looked at, you know, we looked at automation decision support systems, um, we looked at various sort of inputs and for our analysis, we actually um, drew on the computer, the computer science expertise of one of our collaborators, um, Adrian D'Alessandro. And he, uh, we went on to note, we, we wanted to note in this analysis, what kinds of data are actually being collected as well as um, analyzed. So. Um, we looked at the coding behind the machine intelligence using big data um, and as well as the actual models uh, that these data are being fed into. So one of that many people might know, one of the complications is that corporate data sets and algorithms are sort of a black box. They're pretty hard to um, uh, gather detailed information out in, uh, about, and they're also full of assumptions. So uh, we analyzed uh, in our in this analysis, we analyzed original data sets and models where available, um, but also patent applications and, and technical webinars as well. And so we combined this analysis with several, a series of um, farmer and um, a, a smart farming uh, technology expert interviews. So when we actually looked at the um, agricultural data software development industry, like rising firms such as Farming Edge was one of the key um, uh, um, companies that we looked at, we found that the vast majority of, of data sets that were being fed into predictive anal uh, analytics were being collected on major agronomic crops. I'll, I'll, in my next slide, I'll show you the details of that. And so again, this is sort of a bias towards large scale um, um, farmers that what I want to note here is that it not only 
um, results from, but it also reinforces the commercialization of egg technology and information transfer. And this is mainly because agricultural data has become an important form of capital in and of itself, right? This sort of this idea that it's the resource of the future. So given the political um, economic value in agricultural data, we see corporations sort of rushing to collect it. And our research also is showing that not only um, non-industrial farmers, but also data scientists working on these issues relevant to organic, regenerative and agroecological operations are actually highly limited by access to data and data infrastructure. And it's becoming a significant issue that many of the folks that we talked to had named, many data, data analysts. So for instance, when we look at the crop data biases, corn by far the most modeled, 170 cultivars, um, 55 cultivars of rice. I, again, I don't really have time to get into the sort of the details of all of the data, but you have very, very little data on leafy greens, fruiting trees, um, cabbage, any, a lot of the horticultural crops, and certainly very little on organics. So we see then that there's a the sort of um, the, there's a sort of machine intelligence as well of data driven farming that encourages this very narrow expertise uh, that's being built into the data systems and then of course into the machines right because those two often go hand in hand and I think that's a really important it, it, I think it, the ways in which it works as a network right. So for example, much of the experiential knowledge of diverse farm environments, horticultural varieties are not being accounted for in the development of smart farming egg technologies and then the data that comes along uh, with this, which again, further limits the breadth of data. So um, precision farming um, advocates also uh, argue that automated precision systems mean fewer laborers, right? Um, but many farmers and, and workers now are sort of becoming machine minders. They're actually not, they're mainly helping to build data sets without actually benefits to the farmer because the information is um, often getting transferred away from the farmer and the worker and into capital and then the private platforms and the companies. So the, this big question about who's controlling data uh, is a really, I think it's a really important one for the sustainability of um, farmers because the capacity and skill and knowledge is increasingly moving from workers and farmers into fixed commercial capital, science and technology and capital production. So also uh, privatization or uh, including limited data access is dominating sort of this innovation landscape and, and corporations are being pretty well supported by public money. So public and private sector research partnership in, in digital ag innovation is much like the tech sector at large, right? With the fundamental research happening in the public sector while then feeding talent and patent, uh, patented ideas into startups which then get acquired by large companies. And we know that that was very um, clear through, through the data. I'm just gonna skip over this example because of time. But I, I wanna um, point to some issues, in, especially in Canada, but I think in North America, generally commercial digital agricultural tools are supported by, like I said, um, public sector funding, things like the super cluster initiative, um, is a big one in Canada with digitalization following this historic pattern of government privileging the goals of a narrow band of agricultural stakeholders and actors and uh, uh, farmers themselves. And I think we heard this several times in the, in the breakouts in the re uh, report backs. And in North America, it's been built by and for, and a lot of my work is around um, structures of colonialism and race, racism. It's often been built for uh, white settler uh, governments, people, corporations. So um, in North American agriculture, it's evolved very much through labor inequalities and the exploitation um, from the outset of, of labor and of course the um, theft of land. So it's no wonder that now we have um, our current farmland base and industry is nearly entirely owned and managed by a small set of 
white settler farm families, nearly 95%. So there's a huge issue around exclusion in terms of land access, especially for newcomer farmers. And so when looking at the issue of land, um, some uh, research we've been doing is around um, the ag tech startups. We know ag tech, tech startups are growing rapidly. Venture capital investments have contributed you know, 2.8 billion in ag tech startups alone. But what we don't have a clear sense of is the role of digital agriculture in land grabbing, uh, land financialization and um, the concentration of land. So um, when I talk about assetization or land assetization, this is really the transformation of things into resources that generate an income without having, without having to sell the things. So farmland assetization involves transforming agricultural land into a financial asset, which really involves the creation of, of sort of material, organizational, legal, technological conditions that allow investors to profit not only from the productive value of land, but also from its capital appreciation. So they don't actually have to sell the land um, in order to um, make a profit from that. And so this is really um, gonna deepen land into the process of commodification. And the other thing that this can do is reinforce farmland ownership concentration and increase land speculation. So we looked at companies like SIBO, which uses big data tools for farmland valuation, Tillable, which is an online farmland management platform. And they're really making this, these links between farmland investment and digital agriculture. Um, and so what we see is that emerging companies are actually sort of shaping new land valuation systems. So Nuveen and Tillable, these, as these same companies that we, that we looked at, really see farmland investment as, quote, money under the mattress, um, as a lower risk investment that has you know, higher returns over time. And so they really that what they're suggesting is that institutional investment, the investment uh, into land on the part of institutions, might help some farmers be able to grow their land base by leasing it out to these companies. And then these firms recognize the importance of current and coming waves of technological innovation in agriculture in order to enable uh, further capitalization of the farmer. So big data and, and the related technologies um, are seen by these companies as drivers of productivity, obviously higher yields, more efficient practices, and then making farmland investment more, you know, more appealing. Uh, so we, we looked at many of the corporate documents, for instance, um, Tillable's documents state that because yield influences farm revenue, having strong yield data can help substantiate, substantiate a higher price for a farm and then start to build interest in the farmland investment market, not by farmers. Um, this The key is that the interest is from um, investment companies. And so many farmers have stated that their primary reasoning for adopting these technologies, again, was to sort of increase uh, their size, maximize their yields. Um, so uh, we're seeing that companies like Nuveen pointing to these technological advances like, you know, precision guided tractors, uh, planters, sprayers, in order to um, uh, as ways for investors to sort of monitor and surveil farmer decision making and profit making in order to maximize yields. And so these companies are also encouraging farmers to then share the data that's generated from precision ag with the landowners and the companies. In fact, some investment models have incorporated the uh, technological adoption and precision ag practices into their business model as a requirement for farmers to participate. And and to share their data. So, um, it, you know, they have to share their data in order to participate in the program. So there's, um, there's a lot of concerns then, uh, too, about the sort of opaqueness with decision making um, and the sort of incentives to expand, um, as well as these new sort of requirements to participate and how it might further limit farmer choices in terms of their land management. How are these actually going to um, create um, situations where farmers have very few options 
and it might leave even less room for aspiring farmers, newcomer farmers, immigrant farmers to actually be able to access land. Um, so I think I have sort of a lot more to say around uh, these issues of, uh, especially the issues of, you know, access and capa capability to, to capability to actually make use of the data, um, especially in the context of, of land and power. Um, so, but I, I know that I'm sort of at time and so I'll have to, um, I'll have to, I think, leave it, uh, leave it there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and thanks for sharing your email because I know that we will have a lot of questions and a lot of people would like to give you the opportunity to talk more about it. Um, now we're keeping in the line of data, but also shifting gears. We're gonna hear from members of the Gathering for Open Ag Tech or GOAT who put together a curated panel about what they do and about how open source tools and open access to data can empower farmers and how it intersects with organic. Um, they're also collaborating with us on a hackathon in February and they'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, this discussion is moderated by Ankita Rituri, an assistant professor in the agricultural informatics lab at Purdue University. And she's joined by Jamie Gehring, a software developer specializing in um, resilient systems for capturing agricultural data. Mike Stenta, founder and lead developer of FarmOS. Greg Ostick, a member owner of RSI LLC and Juliet Norton, research staff at P Purdue University in the agricultural informatics lab. Um, I'm gonna not, I'm not going to go too deep into their bios because um, I know that Ankita ha, uh, asks everyone in the panel to introduce themselves. So we'll go ahead and get that started. Hi, folks. Thanks for tuning in to our curated panel discussion. I'm here with members of the Gathering for Open Ag Tech, or GOAT to chat about intersectionalities between the open source technology movement and the organic movement. Uh, I'm Ankita Rituri, I'm an assistant professor here at Purdue University. I'm based out in West Lafayette, Indiana, where I run the Agricultural Informatics Lab, and we're focused on the design of open source tech for improved resilience in our food system. Um, in our work, we work with a lot of farmers themselves. We work with researchers, developers, consumers. Um, in effect, we work with a lot of folks who are actually end users of tools um, who have uh, data about different kinds of agricultural systems, uh, right? Folks who are interested in conceptualizing, designing, and building tools. Um, I'd love for each of my colleagues here to introduce yourselves. Um, maybe tell us a little about where you are, what you do, and uh, who you work with as well. Greg. Yeah, I'm Greg Ostick. Um, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of OurSci. I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, our goal is to support communities who want to ask hard questions about the world. And we work with a lot of communities in ag um, who are interested in a wide range of topics like um, food, um, soil health and soil quality, food quality, um, also just general benchmarking. Um, so we work with farmers, researchers, um, project managers, um, agronomists, so pretty, pretty diverse group as well. And then we also manage some of those projects. Uh, great. I'm. Uh, my name is Mike Stenta. Um, I live in the quiet corner of Eastern Connecticut. Um, I work on a project called FarmOS, which is an open source farm record keeping system. Um, I, the project kind of started as a way to keep track of what we were growing, um, but you know we built it as an open source tool so that others could use it as well. Uh, and so we're kind of building a community of, of folks who are, who are helping to work on this software together and push it forward. And we're also working with, with farmers and agronomists and researchers and farming associations to kind of help with their data collection and data organization. Hey everyone, um, I'm Jamie Gehring. I'm based in New York City uh, and I am a software developer working with Mike on FarmOS. I specialize on the mobile platform, a uh, tool called FieldKit. And previous life, I also spent uh, about 15, 20 years working on farms, working in farmers markets in, in the city, um, and handling a lot of agricultural information and communications, uh, which I think informs my work 
uh, on front end design to make that work more easily for farmers. Hi. I'm Juliette Norton, and I'm research staff at Purdue University in the Agricultural Informatics Lab. But I'm located in Martinez, California. I am a computer and information scientist working in the agriculture domain, and I've been in this domain for more than 10 years. I'm involved in curating and serving open plant data and developing open agriculture technology. Um, for the bulk of my work, I am partnering with the Northeast, Midwest, and Southern Cover Crop Councils on their decision support tools for species selection and seeding rate calculation. And that involves um, extensive conversations with farmers and seed companies, farm advisors, and researchers. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, we're in five completely different parts of the U.S., um, but we've, we all met through GOAT, or at least I met many of you through GOAT. Um, I've mentioned it a couple of times, and I would love for maybe Greg, if you could share with folks who are listening in, uh, what is GOAT? What do we do? What's our jam? Sure. Uh, GOAT stands for the Gathering for Open Ag Tech, and it's pretty much what it says. It's a gathering of people interested in creating an open agricultural technology ecosystem. Uh, so we want to make open source tools for, for ag, and we believe that's important to the future of, of ag. Could you actually quickly define for us open source, just for those in the room who may not be familiar with the phrase? Sure. Open source means you've created something. Maybe it's a tool, a piece of software, a piece of hardware, it could be a process even. Um, and you have uh, made public the, uh, the code, if it's software, or the designs, if it's hardware, or the concept, if it's a process. Uh, so that other people can see it. And not only can they see it, but they can actually do it themselves. They don't have to pay you for it or even reference you most of the time. So you're you're putting that information on the world so other people can do it and replicate it. So when we can meet in person, uh, we have had a couple of different types of events. Um, I put together a couple of quick slides uh, for those of you who need some information about what's going on and why we're collaborating, what we're collaborating with the Organic Center on. Um, so there's a couple of links down there if you need information, but here's actually a photo from the conference that Greg mentioned in 2018, uh, right? And so this is where we initially gathered and you can see a little bit of sort of our conceptualization of some of the challenges and tools out there in the open ag tech space. Um, but we're, we're putting together a hackathon in collaboration with the Organic Center and a hackathon is essentially, it's a portmanteau of the words hack and mar marathon. And it's in effect a creative problem solving endurance event, right? So there are different ways in which you can engage. You can draw a diagram representing your research quietly over a day. You can write some code to visualize a data set collaboratively in a few hours. You can rig up an automated irrigation system in several small groups over a couple of days, right? At the end of the day, these are groups of people who are coming together to create something useful, right? As a community over a fixed period of time. And so a hackathon is in effect a space to create something that you think is useful, right? And so these, it means that these things are gonna vary. Sometimes it's a spreadsheet tool, sometimes it's an entire piece of software, uh, right? So what, what it means to create also varies. Sometimes you might only get as far as drawing a diagram of the thing that you wanna see in the world. Sometimes you might actually write an entire code, especially if a, uh, you have some technologists on your team. And so the point of a hackathon is to bring folks from different spaces, right? We bring together a variety of different people to work on, uh, on, on common challenges. So the mission of Go uh, Hack and Organic is to bring together this multidisciplinary cohort of researchers, designers, developers, practitioners, farmers, everybody who is interested in developing equitable open source technical infrastructure to enable the sort of research adoption and evaluation of organic ag practices. Um, there are a couple of different draft challenge areas that we have listed. Uh, we've been working with Jessica and Amber from the Organic Center to try and think about what some of these look like. If you think something is missing, um, please come on to the forums. That links directly to the forum and tell us what's missing. Um, we're trying to basically conceptualize what these challenge areas should be for the hackathon that we're planning uh, ahead in um, February. Let me show you a little bit about some of the hackathons that we have organized in the past. Uh, this was actually the first one, and there were only seven of us at this one, so it was a pretty small group. 
Um, this was at the Real Food campaign. Um, and here we're really focused around trying to think about how we can design tools to enable all farms to be research farms, right? How do we empower everybody to be a researcher? And so in this particular case, we put together a little prototype around soil carbon estimation and, you know, Greg and Mike and a couple of other folks were out there. And it basically was a data collection tool that went from soil sample to our size tools. There were a couple of others in between and then ultimately to farm OS. And so you can see the sort of flow of data from soil to phone in effect in this particular tool. And that was a prototype we built together to show people that it was even possible. From there, when I was at the, at, at the USDA um, in collaboration with Steve Mursky and his crew, as well as Chris Rebecca Horton and his crew down in NC State, um, we threw a hackathon that was focused around this idea of a reconfigurable public ag research pipeline. And there are these four areas, these four challenge areas. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of quick images of what that looked like. So, you know, we were out in a beautiful barn at the ARS Beltsville campus, um, and we had folks come together to showcase a variety of different things that they built over a couple of days. So here, Mike's actually presenting a small prototype that we built to push plant data into PharmOS. And this is now a real project that uh, my team still works on. Um, and so it's a, a good space to prototype projects that may be researchy. Um, this was another prototype that was put together by uh, Barr and her team. Um, and this was focused around pulling together different kinds of UAV data, actually. Um, and then this was actually just a prototype. So if you zoom in, you'll see that Eric uh, from Grow NYC had actually just put together a, a diagram of what he wanted a mapping tool to look like. And so you can see this sort of a range of fidelity of the types of things that you can build during a hackathon. But ultimately, we're trying to come together and you know work on problems that we all care about. So. I say this to, to really invite you, come hang out on the forums, tell us what you're thinking, tell us your ideas, your problems, your challenges, your desires, right? Let's talk about what you wanna build um, and let's think together, let's put our heads together a little bit over this winter and think about what we might be able to build together um, this February. And so the hackathon itself will be, uh, you know, from the 24th to the 26th of February, it'll be a hybrid event, both virtual and in person if uh, the world permits. Um, but outside of that, I know that Jessica and Amber are gonna be sending y'all a whole bunch of information. And so I really hope that you are able to join us. Um, and so the rest of this chat is really to give you some things to think about. And so uh, I hope you enjoy our conversation. It is a curated panel, so you'll see a couple of jump cuts here and there, um, but we had a really fun time producing it. So I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation. And we'll be hanging around in the chat room and at the happy hour later. So if you wanna to talk to us live, we're not just uh, boxes on your screen right now, but we're also hanging out in the chat. Awesome. So we're going to discuss the role of collaborative design and technology in meeting our current and emerging challenges in the organic community. Um, we'll chat about some of the radical ways in which open source tools and open access to data can empower humans, animals, and ecosystems. And we'll showcase several open source tools that are already available um, for use by the organic community. And we'll try to describe how these tools can be used to handle a range of different things from record keeping all the way through to tracking of different kinds of goals. Um, so I want to start by maybe talking a little bit about challenges to resilience. Agriculture involves understanding these sort of complex interactions between humans, animals, plants, and ecosystems to grow food in the context of an ever-changing planet. Um, you know, we've, we face all sorts of challenges from pandemics to climate change, um, including many different kinds of threats to our food and agricultural systems. Uh, what do you all see as some of the wicked problems in improving resilience in food and ag systems? And uh, Mike, why don't you kick us off? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I think record keeping is a really important tool. And especially with regard to uh, organic operations, it's required in a lot of cases too. So for organic certification, you need to keep pretty good records of what's going into your farm, uh, what kinds of seeds you're using, where you're getting them, uh, what inputs you're using, um, and things like that. So having a good ability to kind of keep track of those things, I think is really important. One of the other outcomes of that though is, is traceability too. And, and traceability uh, outside of even just certification is becoming more and more um, important. But it also, it also kind of creates uh, more of a, um, 
a way for consumers and 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 people who are buying the food to see what's going on inside the system too which which i think is an, a net benefit overall to kind of um, ground that into some of the things that have been happening in the last, uh, especially two years. Uh, one of the wicked problems that I feel like we all saw was the issue of reaching consumers when previously utilized food distribution channels were shut down or are they changed? And then, you know, just not only adopting more ecological methods, but also uh, maintaining that economic sustainability when transitioning to those methods. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add too that I think a, an important thing with, with farming um, that kind of demands a certain pragmatism um, when you know balancing all these values um, is there are very real constraints in terms of uh, resources um, and then at the same time, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you have to, you know, get those carrots to a market or um, you know, you need to, there need to be real results that people are truly depending on um, to live. Uh, those problems are going to become more pronounced with climate change. You know, you have to, you have to balance that, uh, that pragmatism with, mm -hmm. you know, the, the bigger, bigger goals too. Um, and they're kind of inseparable to a point, but you have to try. Yeah. And it, it almost feels overwhelming sometimes because of these larger existential infrastructural policy, political challenges in the world. And sometimes it feels weird to say that technology can help with those. But in a lot of ways, if you bring those problems down, there are some very practical day to day things that we can use technology to help with. And so it's almost like technology has this potential to help with these very short term tasks that we are trying to accomplish in service of these longer term, broader, more complicated challenges that I think we're trying to work on as a society. There's a, a lot of discussion, I think, though, around sort of the dangers of building tech for the sake of tech, right? Um, I think when we hear about concerns uh, that people have around technology, you know, we hear things like uh, data sharing issues or we hear about planned obsolescence of technology, algorithm bias. There's a lot out there, algorithmic bias. There's a lot out there. Um, when you're thinking about these, even these pragmatic tools, what are some of the challenges you think we need to overcome as a community of technologists? who are interested in supporting our partners in farming communities, including the organic farming community. I mean, I think, I think we've got to like kind of radically adopt the fact that no one wants to sit in front of a computer ever. So let's not build stuff that causes people to sit in front of computers. And that's not going to happen tomorrow, but like there's, there, there's this some degree of necessary virtual environment that's sort of following us along through our day. But we, it, we shouldn't be building a world in which like we are shoving ourselves in that virtual environment. We should be building a world in which that virtual environment quietly and reasonably walks along with us, gets what it needs, and then provides us exactly what it wants, what we want when we want it and not the other way around. And I think that's just a really radically different way of thinking about what technology should do broadly in society, but like I think in ag too, so. Here, here. Tools are tools. They're not necessarily where we want to be living our lives, even though we speak sometimes in these virtual spaces. Um, what are some other challenges you all have in mind that we need to overcome? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that trust is a major issue right now, especially with a lot of large uh, platforms that are kind of gobbling up lots and lots of data. And they're offering these services for free. Um, but, you know, that kind of adage that if it's free, then you're the product because that data is valuable and it's it can be used for for that kind of profit driven purpose uh, of these larger companies um and there isn't there is an alternative to this you know there is an alternative to uh to having some black box that you're putting this information into um i think we have options now where we we can kind of control that narrative a little bit more and control where our information gets used and make those choices and we can trust by by with things like open source software you can actually view the code you can you can see what it's doing so those algorithms that we always hear about um are not hidden you know in the in these kind of systems so it provides a, it provides an alternative it provides something that you can audit you can trust and even just knowing that other people can audit it even if you don't do it you know that is a level of trust too um i think there's there's just a lot of uh a lot of distrust out there right now and it's justified you know justifiably so
I think uh, another challenge we need to overcome is the rapid obsolescence of technology that we see. Um, I think that there is a lot of potential ways to address these issues, including providing um, the users with the tools to update and modify the technologies. But I think that's um, a massive challenge that we do need to overcome. Um, you know, especially when it comes to technology, um, you know, that these, you know, algorithms and all, they're just forms of making decisions and who writes the algorithm is ultimately who's making some kind of decision with other you know input from users and, and the like yeah i think one of the ways in which at least we might be able to mitigate some of these challenges um and at least one that we try to take uh an approach we try to take in the research space is this idea of taking user-centered design approaches when building technologies and that means bringing actual farmers to the table when you're thinking about the design of a farm management tool or you know bringing the different types of users bringing people who otherwise might not have a say in how the technology is built to the table when you're actually building technology i think this is a big part of what it means to build open source technologies in particular so I maybe want to turn our attention to some of these open source technologies because it's a, you know, collaborative design is a big part of them. Um, but the design of tech is not new, right? Humans have been designing tech to help us grow food for a long, long time. Spear, tractor, now software. Um, and we still build hardware to augment physical actions and we build software to augment our thought processes. And there's lots of different genres of software out there. And that too can be a little bit overwhelming, right? So from uh, you know, fr from from communication tools to online sales platforms, the whole mess of things out there. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you about what you see as the specific worlds of technology and what, what can it help, what can they do to help us overcome challenges in growing food organically? Great, yeah. So um, I can just showcase a couple of quick things that uh, that are sort of related to open source and open source hardware. Um, so FarmHack is a great community that may, many of you may have heard of already. It's been around for a long time, and it really focuses on this idea of open source hardware. So you can, if you're, if you design a tool that helps you on your farm, you can document those plans and share them with others, and then others can can uh, iterate on that as well, and it can kind of grow as a life of its own. So it's sort of an alternative to this idea of well, oh, I just had this great idea, I need to patent it and I need to um, you know, lock it down so that I can bring it to manufacturing and make money and all this kind of thing, which uh, takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and ultimately like, does not result in, in things helping people as, as much, I think. Um, whereas if you have a nice simple tool that you've created, like a root washer or uh, this drip tape um, roller cleaner uh, or this bicycle powered thresher, you can document these kind of things and, and share them with others, which I think is really cool. And, you know, open source often has this, well, it's probably, it's, it's pretty rough, you know, it's not, it's not very polished, but there are also like open source projects that are pretty polished and, and you can like literally just buy a kit and put it together, but it still has this open source ethos to it where, um, you know, you can contribute to it and change it. There's also other initiatives like the open source seed initiative. And this is really just trying to push back against the idea of proprietary patented breeding uh, of seeds where you're literally not allowed to, uh, to, to use a seed or you know, use uh, breeds of certain varieties uh, because they're, they're licensed in that way. Um, other examples are uh, Open Food Network, which is a, an open source food um, distribution hub software. So this started in Australia, but it's been slowly moving. It's now in Europe and there's one in uh, the United States. Um, but it, it serves as a as an online marketplace to connect producers with consumers too, and all open source software. And then of course, GOAT, which is what we're all kind of here from and representing. GOAT is the gathering for open ag tech where we're really trying to like bring a lot of these things together. Um, and if you go to the GOAT website, gotech.org, there's a ton of videos online. We've got a whole video series from different groups who are working in open source ways to share information um, and to, to build tools together. So I, there's a lot going on right now, which I think is pretty exciting. I'd like to just kind of riff off that um, in that some of the ways that um, these, um, you know, GOATs or uh, other uh, initiatives are uh, trying to use technology to overcome some of these challenges in growing food um, and include um, those that help 
farms grapple with the complexities of farming. Uh, a recent data source that uh, emerged that I think is really interesting is the open evapotranspiration project and the allowing large amounts of data to be accessible by um, anyone who signs up to use the, the platform is uh, has the potential to really help um, farms uh, make dis informed decisions on um, their watering or their irrigation in a way that they couldn't before. And I think uh, that's fantastic as well. Um, open land map, I think, is a really amazing tool. And I think what you guys did with the cover crop stuff is a, are all really amazing tools people should see in terms of like the the quality um, that can be provided and the variety of information that's already out there, open source tools. And I think that's one of those things where sometimes you might not even know a tool is open source until you try to figure out how you can customize it or how you can use it in your own work. And so uh, I think it might be helpful for folks who are sort of not familiar with this paradigm, there's a pretty good sniff test you can do with most tools, right? There's usually a contribute page or a, in their documentation, there'll be an invitation to participate. And so there are lots of different clues as you're looking at different kinds of software that you can use to be able to figure out whether or not a tool is something that you can also jump in and influence and inform. It may not be obvious from the outside looking in, but I think the open source technology communities and the open ad, the organic ad communities have a lot in common. Uh, the open source way of building things brings together a community of people who not only use a piece of software, but also have a vested interest in building something um, in building something that fulfills a shared interest or a common goal. Um, so in, in open source, the line between users, developers, producers, consumers, and blurs, everyone has a voice. It becomes this community effort. And the open source paradigm is built on inclusivity and collaboration and really giving power to the people to build the tools that they need exactly how they need it. Um, in the open source world, we also talk a lot about this idea of eating our own dog food. And that means we don't just build tools, but we use the tools that we built. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit from each of you about what drives you to build open source tools and what values you think you share with the organic community. Um, I could start. I think the the reason that I use open source tools is because I can I can trust that they're going to be there uh, in a in a couple years. Um, or if not, you know, I have the code. I can. I can recreate it myself, uh, or the plans, or uh, or things like that, um, and I can fix them if I need to. Uh, I don't have to like, I don't have to call up a dealership to uh, to because I'm not allowed to fix it on my own or something like that. Um, or in the case of code, uh, you know, if if you feel comfortable doing that, you can you can debug it. You can like figure out where the issue is, or if there's a new feature you want that doesn't exist, you can kind of dig in and and learn. Uh, learn how to how to do it, and because and I think you know Jamie made a great point earlier when he said that algorithms and code more generally is really just a bunch of encapsulated decisions. So each line of code is just like if then statements, if this then that, and together it it can create very complicated things. But at its core, it's not that complicated. And I think you know it's it it can feel a little overwhelming to get into it, but. Um, but once you get some of the basics down, it can be really empowering, and you can start to you can start to see and learn more and and how to you know build things that you want. Um, I'll go next. Uh, so one of my primary motivations for building open source is that the problems that I'm either addressing for myself or for the communities that I'm working with uh, are likely being uh, experienced by someone else, and I very much like to share the effort that I've put into with as many people as possible to kind of, you know, um, empower people as much as possible around the world to um, grow their food and grow it organically, I think is a fantastic uh, thing for us to be trying to achieve here by using open source tools and building open source tools. I think in that sense, for for those of us, at least I, I'm, I'm in the academic community, right? I think open source and has a very natural fit with doing publicly funded research, right? I am doing work that is funded by the, the people that I work for, and it makes sense, it only makes sense that the, my, my products, whether it's my knowledge that I produce, whether it's the papers that I'm writing, 
whether it's the data that I'm creating or the tools that I'm building, it only makes sense that they are open access and open source and available to people to use. Um, and so for me, it's sort of, it, it feels obvious as like the, the, the first place to start, but it's not always um, obvious how to keep it going. Because I think one of the challenges that at least I have within the academic community is that we have grants that, that then sort of trim the length of our projects and it means that you know if I disappear, then there's this danger that that project disappears. And I want to build things that are bigger than myself and more than just my contributions. And so I like being part of this larger community, this larger ecosystem, where I am just a part of something more than just myself. And so you know I, I really like that piece of the open source community, where you know if I died tomorrow the work that I have done could be picked up by you and others and anybody else, literally anybody else could just pick up where I left off and keep running and they would only be hampered by the quality of my documentation. Um, <laughs> so that's something that at least, you know, it gives me hope also because then it means that I feel like I'm not just right building things that are going to die and building things that are going to disappear, but I am part of this of this growing evolving ecosystem of tools that are responsive to the natural ecosystem if i may get a little bit esoteric um but yeah well i'll just here i'll i'll take you one more level of esoteric i think i'll just quote what you uh put up in the 2018 go uh conference which is like um you know where's the star trek future we all deserve you know I mean, in, in south of all, everything that's been described so far, I agree, I agree, I agree. But in the end of the day, like in Star Trek, could you not access some programs? I don't think so. Like, I don't think, you know what I mean? I mean, just like, it's, it's silly, but just like looking forward, that is not the universe we're gonna live in in a hundred years. And I think the connection to the organic community, which this feels odd today, but I know, especially the early organic community guys and like the early eighters who were doing this stuff, they they saw organic as like the Star Trek future. I mean, people weren't doing, they saw it as something fun, the huge transition and change. And that transition and change has happened because some people were just like bound and determined to make it happen. And I think in that sense, we're in the same boat. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I wanna get there and we're not gonna get there any other way. Here, here. I'll just add a really kind of purely personal uh, level to this, which for me, uh, despite being a, um, a software uh, developer now, um, I lived for probably 25 years of my life hating technology um, and open source was kind of what turned the page for me, not to be like all too evangelical. Uh, <laughs> evangelical about it but um you know i think it clicked for me using open source software that you know i you know had always looked as looked at soft at technology as something i was accountable to and um you know i had to you know you know keep my phone with me i had to answer that email i had to you know sign on or and sign off at the right time and the wrong time um you know i had to you know fill out these forms online or whatever um and i just it, it aggravated me um and when i started realizing oh actually soft the software should be accountable to me um and do what i want it to do you know um you know and i i had never experienced that before you know i started using open source software um and you know that just opened up a whole world for me and i think hopefully uh farming community understands that kind of experience as well I, I'd love to take that uh, response of yours and maybe frame it as a question to the broader group, right? We've talked a little bit, I touched a little bit here and there on how open source technologies have empowered us and made us feel like something part of, part, have made us feel like we're part of something bigger. Um, what do you see as the ways or the reasons why open source tech is particularly suited to empower organic stakeholders, right? So from farm to fork, building trust, accountability, transparency in this organic supply chain. Let's try to get really um, pragmatic again. I've got one, one quick one is um, uh, in the ag space is quite, is quite, the ag space is a little unusual in that it has a, 
a very large amount of the profit comes from a very small number of products, right? Like corn, soy, wheat, uh, you know, cotton, like there's a couple of things that are done fairly similarly. And so traditional software is going to, basically they're all, it's kind of like, that's the one big fish in the pond. Everyone's going to try to get that one big fish. And then there's a significant, but much smaller portion of the market, which is incredibly diverse, right? That's like, that's like all of your veggies and all, you know, people doing intercropping or other weird things that doesn't fit into this. And I think organic oftentimes sits over here in this very diverse space. And if you just try to use software that's made for this, it will not work for your, and I think like you guys and, and Jamie, I mean, at PharmaWise, I think that's very true very often. So really like, you, I don't put it this way, but there's not a lot of other options. Like that, you know, like because it you require something somewhat custom, and I think open source can serve that well and can, you know, build that interaction with those custom operations well to make something that's actually going to work for them. Yeah, I'll I'll carry with that thought a little bit too, Greg. Um, yeah, I mean I think the the ability to sort of customize for your needs is also uh, really key for uh, for that, and as as well as cost, you know, a lot of the the if you if you look at like some of the large software platforms that are out there for you know for more big ag operations they can be ten thousand dollars a year to use or to license those um whereas open source can be free i mean there's still costs involved in in setting up and running and and updating and things like that so it's nothing's ever totally free but um the barrier is is a lot lower to just jump in and if it works for you great maybe it won't be perfect but you also have the ability to like work on it uh or or augment it and the nice thing that i found anyways just historically about open source is that while it often starts out a little bit more rough around the edges because it doesn't have all of the funding that you know larger companies pour into things over time um it sort of does snowball until it gets to a point where it's just obviously better there's so many like so many examples that we've already seen of that taking place. I mean, now everyone right now uses Chrome or Firefox for the most part. Before that, it was Internet Explorer was your only option, and that was the closed source. Now it's like we just take it for granted that we're all using open source browsers for the most part. And I think that's happening in a lot of a lot of cases. Who uses a Windows operating system on their phone? Does anyone remember that actually there was a whole suite of phones that use the Windows operating system? It does not exist. Like they use, everyone uses Android and I, I mean, just, yeah. Uh, so to circle back about why open source technologies are well suited to empower organic stakeholders in building trust, accountability, and transparency, I think a big part of that is the involvement of the community in the building of these technologies like an open source technology isn't built without a community that's impossible the the lines between developer and and user blurring and where oftentimes our farmers are uh, or or stakeholders and um, our community members are involved in actually creating these um, these technologies and so we we start to see like actually a community being built because of this kind of like community formation around these open source technologies, you start to see that there's more of a um, public or community ownership and intellectual property about this rather than a, a private ownership. And so we learn and we create as a, a community and that that knowledge is distributed. And so rather than just siloed and to my own personal knowledge on how this works, um, we, we start to um, see that being um, distributed and spread apart as, um, as, as, a com as a community resource and asset. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow that a little bit too, just by saying that I, I see open source and, and these kind of communities as so much more scalable too than the alternative. Because if you've got one company who has a product and they've got you know 20 employees who are providing support for that product or who are working on that product, that's the limit. And you know, if, if the company is not making any profits, they're not going to be adding to that staff. But with an open source project, anyone who wants to who wants to contribute to it can. So this base can just grow and grow and grow, and they can provide support to each other. So there's this kind of community uh, support effort too. Just like now, if you're if you're uh, dealing with some kind of blight on your on your crops in a greenhouse or something, you can go and ask your neighbor who's a who's a farmer, you know, what 
what have you done to deal with this? Or you, you know, talk, talk in a forum about how to do that. These kind of communities already exist. They're sort of taken for granted, I think, that we already kind of work in that way. And we've kind of lost some of that with, with, uh, with software products, I think. Yeah. I think uh, I'm just going to maybe try to summarize some of the things that I've been hearing as the values that we have in common between the open source and organic movements. There's this focus on trust and community and inclusivity. There's this thinking about the longer term. There are these strategies to evolve and adapt with changing communities and climates. I think both communities strive to empower community members, including through coordinated yet decentralized production of food and or software, and ideally both sometimes. Um, we have community members that deeply care about what they're doing. Um, in open source, we aim for technological resilience and building tools that live beyond us. And in the organic community, I see food system resilience. I think our group has argued that open source tools for organic agriculture can build that sort of intersectionality when it comes to thinking about resiliency. So I want to dive into things a bit more practically. I want each of you to tell me a little bit about what you've actually been working on. Um, I'm going to put, uh, put Mike on the spot. Um, so the, the software that I'm working on right now is called Farm OS. Uh, and Farm OS is essentially a, a web application that you can run yourself, um, which allows you to keep records of everything that you're doing. And it's, it, it's kind of built in a very general way so that you're, you're able to really record almost any kind of thing that you're, that you're working on. Um, so there's a lot of, there's, uh, we've got um, a lot of people kind of contributing to this and trying to make it better. There's a lot of discussions. We, we've got a very active um, forum that, uh, you know, would welcome all of you to join and, and come uh, take part in, uh, where we talk about, you know, how to use FarmOS, what kinds of things are you trying to record, and, and how do you represent them in, in a system like this, or, you know, how do you, uh, how do you want to share that information with others if you want? It, uh, so it, it's important to say that FarmOS is like private by default. So everything you put into it is yours and it's like a database that you control and you own. Um, but we're also working on features for sharing, opting into sharing little pieces of things with other, with, with researchers or with um, other platforms that might be able to provide you with recommendations or things like that. So there is value in some sharing, but it needs to be under your control is, is sort of, you know, how we're thinking about it. But FarmOS, you know, you can you can map out your farm. You can record things like the animals you're managing, the equipment, the plants. You can also have sensors. So if you want to, um, and go on farmhack.org to find some ideas for for uh, building your own little DIY sensors with like they make these things called a Raspberry Pi, which is a little computer. You can put it in your greenhouse with a temperature monitor on it, set it up to send you an alert if it gets too hot or too cold, things like that. Um, and all of your your activities and logs that that you're recording throughout the season, like when did you seed something? What kinds of inputs did you put into it? Are you moving your animals from paddock to paddock? Uh, a lot of these things are required for organic certification, but even beyond that, it's just so helpful to be able to go back and see when you did it. I use it all the time to remember, like when when did I apply lime or something to a to a field, or uh, how many pounds of garlic did I harvest last year? Um, I also have a little, I, I made a little quick form so I can record every morning when I go and collect eggs, how many eggs did I collect? And what's nice is that over time, you just start, you know, accumulating all of these records that can then be, uh, you know, someone might write a, a module that um, will render that as a report. So I can see like how my chickens have done over the years or how, how my um, production has done in and different ways. Mike, you farm as well. Could you yeah. maybe even just tell us a little bit about why you built FarmOS in the first place? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I started out uh, building some some pieces of software for a CSA that uh, my friend and I had started years back. And so I built some tools for, you know, managing our subscribers and our, our newsletter and our delivery route and our website and that kind of thing. And over time, that sort of, I got more and more interested in also it sort of led to like, well, okay, we want to show people what we're growing. So we also need to kind of record what we're growing. And that then sort of led more and more into just, you know, record keeping and, you know, what plants and thinking about how to model a farm. And I just got kind of got locked in on that, um, on that sort of mental exercise of how do you represent a farm in a database? And how do you represent all the different kinds of farms, which is 
hard. You know, there's there's a lot of different things. So yeah, you know, PharmOS is modular also, which I think is an important piece because that means that you can turn on and off different features depending on what you need. So if you're not doing animals, turn off the animal module. Or if you need something more specific, like a, a very specific data entry form, like that you want to be able to pull up in the field, you can write a module. It's not that hard and we've got some good documentation on it. So I'll show, I'll just point to like pharmos.org is a great place to go for more information. Um, we also host monthly calls with the community. So it's kind of like office hours if anyone wants to join and ask questions. The forum is also a good good way to do that too. And we're working on a PharmOS 2.0 right now. We're about to release the first beta of that. So it's pretty exciting. And maybe just one one last question before we move on. Are there any particular features within this ecosystem that um, might speak to organic farmers? Anything around certification or plans on that front? Yeah, so there, a number of PharmOS users are recording their certification records in PharmOS. And uh, I've heard from a number that their certifying agents come back to them and like, this is great. I'm so happy that you know, you're know you using this because it just makes my job so much easier. Because not only can they come out and see the records, but you can also actually give them a login to it. So they can like look at it from their office uh, on the other side of the state if they needed to save the drive. I love that software brings us together even though we are apart. I want to I wanna bother Greg a little bit. I know you both work together a fair bit, but Greg, you uh, work with a whole range of farmers and have a pretty broad diversity of things that you're working on. Would you mind sharing a couple of those with us? Sure. Um, so first I'll just say, you know, our goal, um, uh, Well, maybe if you're there, it looks like um, the video froze. Yeah, stand by. It looks like one of my computers stopped. Give me one moment. Looks like the Wi-Fi disconnected. Stand by. Work together a fair bit, but Greg, you. Uh, work with a whole range of farmers and have a pretty broad diversity of things that you're working on. Would you mind sharing a couple of those with us? Sure. Um, so first I'll just say, you know, our goal um, uh, at our side, which is the company that we run, is to support communities to build knowledge together. And so what Mike just described is, I, as an individual, how do I store my data? How do I manage my farm as an individual? And so in the ag space, you know, we're asking that question like, okay, well, how do we take a lot of individuals who have their sort of sovereign rights to their data and help them organize that data in a way that, that we can say something together, right? We can ask a question. Um, uh, so um, I'll kind of, um, hopefully the screen share works. Uh, All right, so um, so we do a couple of things. So one thing that we do is we have a um, piece of survey software called SurveyStack, and it is just survey software. You take a survey just like anything else. You just you know walk through the survey. This is a survey where you input planting information. You know, it has directions and tells you what to do, and um, you know you has drop down lists and all the things you would expect from a survey, um, but we actually connect users to PharmOS accounts. So it allows someone to fill out a very custom survey um, and push that data to their personal PharmOS instance. And the benefit of this is, um, let's say I'm, uh, I'm an agronomist working with 50 farms uh, and I'm supporting those farms to collect information because a lot of times farms aren't great at it or they collect some of it in paper and some of it in different systems or all that kind of stuff. But we want to start to think about our community together, ask questions across the community. There's a lot of great organizations that do this. Um, PASA is a good one. NOFA does this. Um, and, and we actually work with them. 
So if I'm an agronomist trying to ask those questions, you know, how do I work with these users and maintain their data independently, but give them a consistent and simple experience for inputting that data? And that's what these forms do. So this actually, these fields, which are silly names, but they pull from my farm OS instance, this test farm. Uh, and so when I finish this form and push it at the very end, I actually push data to that farm OS instance, right? So like I can create this field using a survey and survey stack. So if I was just one single individual user, I would just use farm OS. But if I'm trying to work with a large group of farmers, and provide data consistency and comparability so that in the end we can ask a question with all that data, then SurveyStack is a useful tool. So that's one thing that we work on. So yeah, I would say if you're an agronomist, you're a soil health coach, you're uh, running research trials, um, you're a university with a lot of um, farm partners, those kind of things, this is a good tool. Um, so then on the flip side of that, once you have a bunch of farm OS instances controlled by individuals, with comparable data in it, now you wanna be able to compare the data, right? So that's our next step. And it's something that we're actively working on now, we'll be ready for next year, but we call that the, the farmer coffee shop. That's super cool. So I, I love that. So Mike, you described a little bit about how I as an individual farmer can manage my own data within my private ecosystem. Uh, Greg, you showed us a little bit about how I might start to talk to others, share my data with those that I trust to be able to start learning from each other, whether it's through the research networks and using the forums like those uh, that you showed in the survey stack tool or in the prototype that you just shared with us around the digital coffee shop. Um, I love seeing different types of prototypes and this is at least a big part of what we do. So I might just jump in with sharing a little bit about what, what we do. Um, so here at Purdue, and you know, this is how I've, I've worked with many of you as well, um, we have a little lab um, in which we focus on doing design research uh, and technology development uh, on different threads. And so some of our projects are, you know, doing the user experience research, talking to your constituents, Greg, when you were designing the digital coffee shop or- uh, I should have done that, yeah. Kita, <laughs> like, did the human-centered design process for the digital coffee shop. No, so no worries, no worries. Um, <laughs> But we, we also have been doing uh, work with, we're starting some work with Open Team, which is a larger collective of open source technologists and farmer networks to try to ask questions around how folks are collecting data related to soil health management um, and specifically to be able to inform the design of different kinds of technologies. Uh, I'll share two in particular, and I'll let Juliet speak about one of them in a little bit more detail. Um, but one of the projects that we started last year was really focused around community food resilience. And so, you know, we saw during the pandemic, lots of folks were switching distribution channels from institution to direct to consumer. A lot of technologies were being adopted to try and uh, to try and pivot um, in a very trying time for lots of different kinds of farmers. And so what we really what we were really focused on was trying to ask questions around the suitability of technology and how appropriate uh, how appropriately or inappropriately tools were helping. Uh, right. So what was the role of technology in being able to help people uh, coordinate both food production, but then also distribution, right? How are people getting to market? And so we started um, mostly just through community calls, listening to people's challenges around, um, you, know, uh, you know, around selling food in, in, in times of COVID. And then we actually started to do some qualitative research where we were talking to different uh, farmers and farm supporters. So, right, again, thinking about uh, the community in agriculture is not just being farmers also, but also, you know, your farmers market managers, your food hub coordinators, your crop advisors, your extension folks, your consumers, right? We're all part of this larger community. And so we started by talking to a variety of different folks to learn more about the different ways in which software was being used um, or the different types of software that were missing uh, within the, within the, um, within community food systems. And we're actually now beginning to sort of close that phase. We, you know, we, we did a lot of data collection and now we're trying to think about the design of local food toolkits. And so this is something that, you know, if folks are interested in working on or, or chatting with us about, I'd love to be able to, to, um, to work with you on these types of concepts. Um, something that is a little bit more finished uh, is work that I had started when I was out at the USDA ARS, and this is in collaboration with some folks um, there and uh, in NC and uh, North Carolina State University and a couple of other places, but mostly in collaboration with the Northeast Cover Crops Council. Um, and this is a tool focused on both 
crop advisors, but then also growers themselves. Um, so with that, um, I really hope that you are ex as excited as I am for the hackathon that we're going to be putting on together with the Organic Center in 2020. We're hoping to bring together a whole bunch of folks who are interested in these common challenge areas around organic agriculture. Um, we'll be, we'll, we'll bring the developers. We're hoping uh, some of y'all in the room, farmers, researchers, um, folks in extension, people interested generally in organic agriculture, please come one, come all. Um, there'll be more information available on these websites. So you can feel free to check out the Organic Center's website. They'll make sure that uh, you are apprised of when and where things are happening and on the forum we will have at least a little bit of discussion in the interim about the actual projects that we'll be all working on um, and so with that uh, we'll see y'all at the happy hour later on online um, thank you for listening and uh, have a great day bye ah thank you so much to the entire goat team for that video <clears throat> excuse me i really love seeing all of your ideas and the work um, the work that you've been doing in this sort of like virtual fireside chat kind of format. Um, we're going to shift gears and go back into hearing um, from some more speakers. And I am personally very excited to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Julie Guthman, who is a professor of social sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Dr. Guthman teaches um, multiple courses on the politics of food and ag and conducts research on food system transformation in the United States. Her publications include over 50 peer-reviewed science articles and three multi-award winning monographs um, with book titles that you might recognize, such as The Classic Agrarian Dream, The Paradox of Organic Farming in California. I think any rural uh, sociologist student has come across this. <laughs> Um, also, Wilted, Pathogens, Chemicals, and the Fragile Future of the Strawberry Industry, and Weighing In, Obesity, Food Justice, and the Limits of Capitalism. In addition to her very renowned research and publication record, um, Julia is the recipient of the Excellence in Research Award from the Agriculture, Food, and Human Value Society. And currently, <clears throat> she is the principal investigator of the UC AFTER project, which is a multi-campus collaboration that is investigating the Silicon Valley's recent um, charge into food and agriculture, which among other questions has led her to explore the synergies and um, frictions between agroecology and ag tech, which we've sort of seen emerge in the chat earlier today. So I'm Excited to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here and um, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you. Let me share my screen. Yes, I do want to do that. Okie doke. One more second. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for including me at this conference. Um, I'm super intrigued by the topic. It's really kind of one of the underpinning questions in my current research. Um, and so I've gathered a lot of already. Um, uh, I, I realized I gave kind of a braggy bio, which is probably inappropriate. I think I want to say a little bit more about my research as a by way of introducing what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I am a geographer and my first, um, so my dissertation was my first social, was the first social science project on organics in California. Um, and I looked at the political economy of organic as, um, as in its economic pressures, as well as the certification practices and how together they affected, affected the adoption of agroecological methods. My more recent research has involved California's strawberry industry and oops, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide already. Oh boy. Um, my most recent research has involved California strawberry industry and its ability to move to more sustainable methods with tighter restrictions on um, highly toxic soil fumigants. So for both of these projects, I found that land and land values play a critical role. Um, it's very difficult to incorporate less intensive methods, such as the rotation of lower value crops, 
um, when land values are based on the presumption of high yields of high value crops. And I'm gonna come back to that problem in a bit. So these days I am the um, PI for this National Science Foundation funded uh, project, which is investigating Silicon Valley's forays into Silicon Valley, its visions and products related to agriculture and food actually. Um, our acronym of the AFTER project was like all good acronyms conceived in a bar. Um, but our most central question is how food and ag tech entrepreneurs are defining problems and developing solutions, especially in the context of Silicon Valley's innovation and investment cultures. Um, with their penchant for disruptive innovation, Silicon Valley's recent entree into agriculture is based on the premise that they can make farming more sustainable. This is of course what organic farmers have been aiming to do for a very long time, but largely through other means. So the critical question as we've been discussing today is whether ag tech can be brought into meaningful synergy with organic farming. Um, spoiler alert, the answer is that it depends on what we mean by ag tech and what we mean by organic. So in my remarks, I wanna focus on the differences in the political economic underpinnings of the two fields and whether they can be overcome. So I'm gonna ask you to indulge me um, in a lesson in the key concepts in agrarian political economy. This is a field occupied by rural sociologists, geographers, and anthropologists who study where economic value is created and extracted in farming and its surrounding industries. And what I'm gonna say may seem obvious, but I think it's the basis for many of the tensions that we're talking about today, talking about today and what we're seeing in the fields writ large. Um, and it obviously speaks to many of the discussions in the chat. So much of ag agrarian political economy begins with the core premise first articulated in Karl Kautsky's agrarian question in eight, written in 1899 where he asserted that farming is different than industry because of its basis in nature. Now, Kowski, it turns out, gave a lot of emphasis to issues of land. He talked about, or he wrote about how available land may be discontinuous and dispersed, which would make it difficult for businesses to expand and centralize. Um, this is a problem that's easily overcome. We can just visualize farm equipment driving down the road to another site, knowing that farmers are perfectly capable of um, having large operations on different non-contiguous plots of land. But others in the tradition of agrarian political economy have focused even more intensively on the natural characteristics of farming that are familiar to us all. One, that farming is seasonal, crops can't be grown continuously, animals don't produce eggs and milk evenly. Two, that farming is subject to nature's vagaries, floods, droughts, freezes, and more. And see, of course, that farming is subject to ecological upsets, depleted soil, diseases, pests, unwanted plants, otherwise known as weeds, and so forth. And so the argument that agrarian political economists have made is that the introduction of many technologies in agriculture were all about mitigating, if not always overcoming, the challenges that nature throws at farmers. Now, examples of this are, are of course legion, but include synthetic fertilizers to address soil exhaustion, but also to minimize need for fallow periods and animal manure and crop rotations. Biological and chemical pest controls for fungi diseases, insects, weeds, many of which we know are highly toxic. Growth enhancers um, for animals, mainly antibiotics and steroids to prevent disease and spur growth, ripening agents on crops to speed um, their growth. Electrification, um, which has not only warmed and cooled animals and ventilated them and allowed machines to run, feeding and milking machines, but actually changed the biology of animal reproduction, like using electricity to fool chickens into laying eggs year round. And of course, plant and animal breeding. So organisms grow faster, bigger, or more evenly. 
So you can already see the tension here. And I, there's a reason I've kind of elaborated this, which we all know about. Organic agriculture came of age in opposition to many of these technologies. Instead of synthetic fertilizers, crop rotations and composting, instead of pesticides, biological pest controls and trap crops, no use of growth, no use of growth agents, non-GMO, which of course remains contested. Indeed, for many practitioners, the most fundamental principle of organic farming is to work with nature rather than try to overcome it. So yes, organic ag tech does seem an oxymoron at first glance. Now these days, the ag tech we're seeing these days is being pursued in the explicit interest of sustainability and animal health, rather than productivity per se, kind of. Um, however, with many of these applications we're seeing, the aim of the technology is really not all that new. Um, we see many, many applications designed to enhance farm efficiency, um, often based on the idea that um, efficient use is less resource intensive. So the difference we're seeing is that efficiency is now being spun as a sustainability goal rather than a productivity goal. But in other ways, some of the um, applications we're seeing in ag tech entail a very different approach to sustainability. Rather than designed to overcome nature or even or to work with nature as organic farmers have purported to do, they are designed to minimize its role. You can see this most clearly in controlled environments of indoor growing, including the use of soilless substrate. And as Kathleen mentioned today, of course, the, um, the hydroponic growing remains a source of much debate in organic circles. This may also entail the use of highly abundant natural resources rather than scarce ones. You can see this in efforts to fabricate meat from cells or simulate its flavors and textures using the abundant life of fungi and algae. And there are exceptions to this growing field, and I'm going to get to those. But for now, I just want to bring attention to the operating logics of ag tech. And that is because these logics affect how economic value is made and distributed. So that's what I want to turn to now, the political economy of these logics. And I'm going to discuss three related dynamics in particular. And again, apologies for the little lesson here, but I'm going to talk to you about them briefly as appropriationism, big word, technology treadmill, and intensification. And what I want to suggest here is that ag tech and organic have been in tension over these very dynamics. So appropriationism, this is a, is a term that was first coined by Goodman, Sorge, and Wilkinson in it, their seminal and still super relevant 1987 book, From Farming to Biotechnology. I refer to this book all the time, and it's amazing how much they predicted of the, what we're seeing in, in current ag and food tech. Um, as they laid out, processes of appropriationism are at work when companies bite off pieces of the production process that they can produce elsewhere and sell them back to farmers as inputs. So historically, appropriationism first involves selling farm machinery to substitute for plant, for excuse me, for animals and human labor. Later involves selling seeds, pest control, and fertility inputs. And what that meant is that farmers had to pay for once, what they once produced on the farm, meaning that farm value was being appropriated by other actors. That's where we get that clunky term. And so when I started doing research on organics in the early 1990s, one of the things I found is that a lot of farmers were moving to organics to recapture some of that value by producing more of their inputs on the farm rather than buy them from input suppliers. And appropriation led to what is famously called the technological, technological treadmill. Many technologies um, say, sold back to farmers made farms more efficient. They were able to produce more with fewer resources and thus make higher pro profits. Um, and that's exactly what ag tech is promising today by way of precision technologies. Mm -hmm. 
but what then why is it called a treadmill? I'm sure most of you have heard this about this before, but it's worth repeating. The way the treadmill works, if those if the, is that those who are early adopters of the technology make the high profits. But as others jump in and adopt these technologies, there everybody's producing more. There's more units on the market. And if markets aren't growing, which they often don't do in farming unless there's population growth, um, price competition ensues. So prices flatten or come down and farmers are left with the same or lower profits as before. And those who don't adopt can't even compete. Even They even go out of business. And those who do adopt the technologies and stay in farming and increasingly depend on economies of scale, lots of, lots of production with small margins. And so then they get on the treadmill again with another technology. So here again, many farmers that I have interviewed over the years entered into organic production precisely to escape this logic. They began growing higher value crops that would maintain value outside of treadmill logics. When I first started interviewing people in the 90s, I learned of people who had moved from cotton to carrots or to kiwi, and then from kiwi to organics. And in the beginning, at least, organic markets provided that extra value. And then there's intensification. Um, many of these technologies, of course, led to intensification, which I mean here by producing more on any given piece of land not only in more output, but more rotations, sped up temporalities. So if you think about a place like Salinas, which is an example I always like to use, Salinas farmers buy their starts from a nursery, their fertilizer from the farm supply, their irrigation and pest control from contractors, their transplanting services from contracts, from, con from services, and then they grow high value leafy greens and they can harvest several rotations because they can get those plants in and out of the ground really quickly. In the, in the strawberry industry, um, they used to rotate fields, but then that when, they, when soil fumigation came along, it allowed growers to plant on the same block year after year. But here's the deal, and this is where land values come in. If you produce more on a piece of land, often you, you the farmer, don't keep it. Bankers and landowners will ask for more and so land values increase. And farmers have often lost out on that logic too. And that has been a real struggle for organic farmers. How do you grow cover crops or let land fallow or grow trap crops or, you, or, or make your own compost when land values are based on intense rotations of high value crops? It only works if organics maintain their high values if that price premium persists. So my point is that while technology have has, has, of course, made it easier for farmers, it has not made them more profitable. Farmers have, have seen value appropriated by others and the need to constantly speed up in order to stay in business. So I always find it really telling when a Silicon Valley entrepreneur makes a pitch at the many uh, events I've attended, including the one pictured here, um, that their technology will make farmers more profitable by making them more productive, which we've also heard that today. Um, but when, in what I've seen and what others have seen is pro productivity and appropriation has been the source of farmers' economic problems, not the, the savior of them. And again, many organic farmers entered into organic production to put themselves on better footing and they saw in that organic price premium that comes with organic certification and marketing as something that would, would buffer these economic dynamics and hopefully allow them to grow in somewhat le less intensive ways closer to organic principles. Um, so if you believe what I've said so far, and I'm sure it's debatable, but the tech development has in some ways created the conditions that organic is positioned against and created the economic conditions that organic has tried to buffer, 
What does that mean for the proposed confluence of current ag tech and organics? Well, as I said early, or it depends on what we mean by organic and it depends on what we mean by ag tech. Regarding what we mean by organic, clearly most farmers do not practice a pure form of agroecology where all inputs are produced on the farm, which would obviously make ag tech highly incompatible with organic. To the contrary, most employ some sort of input substitution model where they purchase those inputs that are allowed by organic standards. So organic agriculture is, as it's mainly practiced is not inherently in tension with ag tech, but organic farmers must still contend with the political economic dynamics that are exacerbated by ag tech. And if they get on that treadmill, they keep running. So then we come to the question of what we mean by ag tech. In the Silicon Valley ag tech world I study, tech is being developed with agronomic principles not entirely compatible with organic principles, including removing nature from the equation rather than working with it, using GMOs, synthetic inputs, and soilless substrate which is allowable, but still contested. Even more significantly, many of the technologies are being developed with backing from venture capital, which as has already come up today, insists on patents as a way to ensure that startup companies and their financiers will make money. So no matter what they say, it's hard to have that as a goal to make good on their promises to venture capital and make farmers profitable. Moreover, in emphasizing efficiency, many of the technologies being developed will arguably have the effect of exacerbating the economic challenges rather than mitigating them. So in my view, what would make ag tech compatible with organic is both different technologies and different business models. Different technologies might be those that serve other ends and productivity per se, that perhaps even support on-farm development of inputs. And there are a few out there, microbials designed to help build soil, products that ferment food waste for biofertilizers, soil testing equipment. Um, it's already, somebody already raised the issue today of, um, of equipment to test soil, uh, soil ecologies. That sounds great. As for business models, they would have to support farmers' livelihoods, not make them pay. Clearly, many of the technologies coming out of Silicon Valley are being developed under proprietary wraps and with promises to venture capital and have no such intentions. So to sum up, if ag tech means produced by Silicon Valley funded entrepreneurs and sold back to farmers, especially in the name of productivity, the two fields don't seem compatible at all. But if ag tech means produced in co cooperation with organic farmers geared toward enabling agroecological practices cooper or maybe cooperatively, cooperatively funded by universities um, or other non-for-profits or made available to hackers or produced with open source technology, then we're talking. But that's not the current currently the field in which ag tech is growing and that's pretty much what worries me so i'll close there thank you thank you julie as always your talk is fire <laughs> um i'll also point out that you're getting called the legend in the chat box so. <laughs> that's and for those of you who are interested in the points that julie made um Definitely come to our February 10th conference. We're going to be digging into a lot of those more deeply. So um, now I'm going to pass it to Dr. Heather Darby. She's going to be talking about how to make sense of all the information out there when it comes to ag tech. Dr. Darby is an agronomist with the University of Vermont Extension. And for the past 18 years, she's been working in partnerships with organic producers to develop and deliver relevant and practical research and education to the community. And her and her family also own and operate a certified organic farm in Vermont. So Heather, I will pass it over to you. Great, thank you so much. And um, agreed, the um, 
presentations have just been great today and have given me a lot to think about. And I'm, I'm kind of glad I got to go near the end in a way. And Julie, I think you, um, you talked about a lot of things I was thinking about. So as Jessica said, I, I'm here in Vermont. Um, I hope most people know where that is. <laughs> I usually have to put a map up because people often think Vermont um, or New England is a state and Vermont's a town in it. Um, but we do, we do farm in Vermont. And um, I think, you know, Vermont sort of represents um, small and medium sized, very diverse farms in a, in a very large organic community. And my job with the University of Vermont Extension is to work very closely um, with these farmers here in this state and beyond. Um, and so I'm bringing that perspective. So please keep in mind, I'm from a small state <clears throat> with lots of different challenges. Um, and we have lots of organic farmers that are small and medium sized, but I'm also bringing my farmer perspective to this as well. And I titled my talk Demystifying Technology because I feel like for many of our farms, um, that's, that's where we're at. How do we help farmers make appropriate tech choices? And I think this goes really well with, with what we just heard about. It, it's way beyond, uh, once you get to the farm level, um, you know, tool development and all the exciting things that it can do, there are just so many considerations and I think as, as professionals here, we also have to think about who's going to help the farmers make those decisions, help them understand what are the appropriate tech choices for their farm, their personal goals. Um, and, um, and I have a little bit to say about that. So hopefully it'll generate some interesting discussion. Um, so I feel like, you know, Vermont sort of represents what I would call underserved farmers in this sort of bigger scheme of agriculture in this country, because again, we're a very small state. Most of these farms here are, are small, very small to medium scale agriculture. We have uh, very diverse operations. Um, we have a large number of organic farms. I, I don't think we're underserved because we have a lot of trees, but I'm saying that because it does play really heavily into um, ag tech and the ability to access ag tech. We have a lot of really small fields. Um, some of the fields that I have soil sampled in Vermont, um, my lawn is bigger than that. I often wonder how they can turn a tractor around in some of these fields. Um, we had terrible internet, and I said barely, and then cell service, I mean, almost forget about it. Um, and we hear these complaints a lot from the farming community because um, farmers clearly want to and, and are trying to use some levels of technology. And it's very difficult in a place like Vermont where we're just challenged to even get cell service. Um, throughout much of the state. So here, I feel like we represent this, um, you know, position where, where we, we don't have a lot of technology outreach or, or technical service related to, to technology. And I think a lot of organic farmers, especially around this country, as they have felt in the past about, you know, many different things, uh, we're underserved. Um, especially when it comes to the technology realm. So, I mean, clearly in Vermont and elsewhere, there's already lots of technology on farms. There's already technology on farms in Vermont, things we don't really think about. And this has been mentioned, you know, throughout the day. Smartphones, um, you know, are very predominant on farms in Vermont as well. And they clearly are a business tool. And I say that because when I'm teaching class to a group of farmers, um, they don't know how to use a computer, but they have smartphones um, and they're constantly ringing the entire class. And that's when sort of the light bulb went off in my head as an extension specialist um, that, you know, delivering technology, programming, et cetera, through farmer smartphones and cell phones was really a great avenue because many of our farms in Vermont already use that technology. 
And much of our conversation today seems like, you know, smartphones are a little bit not so techy, <laughs> but it is does represent technology um, and access to other programs, um, et cetera, on farms. Um, many of our farms also, and I'm sure across the country, really use technology to connect to their markets and their consumers. And again, that's really challenging um, in, in a place like Vermont where we have poor internet. Um, I was in a meeting just the other day with some organic maple producers that were trying to set up an online, <laughs> online um, sales platform and they just have such poor internet, they don't even think they're gonna be able to do that. So tech challenges um, you know, that we're talking about today really revolve around new tools and robots and things coming out the door. But in many places across this country, we don't even have the basic functionality um, to get internet or, or cellular um, service. So <coughs> as I said, you know, of course, farmers are adopting technology, um, some more, you know, more quickly than others. And, you know, really the question comes, what is it actually that we need to help with? You know, what about it do we need to help demystify? And um, what is it that we need to, that we need to be doing? Uh, so, whoops, wrong slide. This really brings me to extension, and I, I pulled this um, off the NIFA website, really talks about extension, university extension system, and, and what we're supposed to be there for. Um, and really, throughout the definition and the description, it keeps talking about modern technologies, evidence based science, bringing this out to rural communities. Um, and training people on these types of modern technologies and helping farmers to adopt um, these technologies. Now, extension itself, at least in my region, has not really been on the forefront of technology. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm also speaking for myself. It took me quite a while to get a smartphone, but, um, I'm, I'm certainly concerned about the university's ability through the extension system to be able to effectively help farmers make technology decisions that are appropriate for their operation. Um, it's in the definition and really the mission of extension, but are we doing it? And is it something that we need to be thinking about amping up? Because I believe, as we've heard today, there is more and more and more technology that's going to be passing by, you know, the farmers' um, doorsteps, salespeople, et cetera. And how are they going to filter through all of this? And are we in the extension system at a point where we can actually help them? So it's just some, you know, food for thought, something I really feel we need to be thinking about and, and definitely talking about. So I wanted to give some examples from my work and just tell you how I've been trying to navigate this and coming up with kind of methods, um, a framework to use when I'm working with farmers. And again, I'm not the most tech savvy person. And so I'm learning on the fly. And we have lots of opportunities for folks in the you know, university system to work with each other to develop these tools, but we don't really have that same framework for people like myself that work in extension to really figure out how we're going to help farmers decide if they should even use these tools. And if the tools that are being developed even meet the needs of the people that we expect are going to use them. So I feel like this, you know, is a is a shortcoming. Technology is exciting, um, and there's lots of opportunity, as we've heard. And I agree. I'm excited about it too. I can't wait to get a robotic weeder on my farm. But should we just be adopting technology just because it's new technology? And I think, um, as the prior speaker said, well, I hate to to blow the answer to the question, but <laughs> no, we shouldn't, right? So just like everything else on a farm, 
we need to be making really good business decisions and thinking once again about, is this technology appropriate for my farm? Um, in my mind, technology should serve a purpose. <laughs> it shouldn't just be there because it's the newest, greatest, coolest thing. Um, everybody else is doing it. Um, you know, the salesperson came and they said, I should definitely be adopting this technology. It needs to serve a purpose on a farm. You know, it needs to address a concern on the farm or identify or even solve a problem. Um, and really understanding like, why is technology really the answer um, to the issue you're having? Or will it actually help make it better? And probably more importantly, will you get a return on that technology investment? Who helps farmers make that decision? We can't talk to each other, so nobody's gonna answer me, but I think we know the answer. Well, I don't know. Who makes, who helps farmers make those decisions, especially in areas like Vermont, where technology, I don't wanna say it's new, but we don't have the same level of service providers or maybe even basic knowledge um, who's going to help farmers make those decisions? And I have this robotic melter here up on the screen because right now I'm working with a farmer who told me they're spending $2,500 a week on labor. And, you know, the robotics uh, melter, you know, salesperson came out to the farm and they're just convinced that they should be getting a robotic melter. And, you know, I simply said, are you, are you sure that that's the right answer? And again, the technology seems great. The people that are you know, out there that really believe in their products and really believe in robotic melters, of course, are gonna say it's the best decision for you, but how are you then really gonna make the best decision for your farm? So why is technology the answer? Why do you need it? Uh, what is it about it? How's it really going to help your farm improve? And are you going to get a return on investment? And I think those are all questions that farmers should be asking. Um, and even beyond that, you know, like different val values you have, different, you know, kinds of companies you want to support. How do you go through that decision-making process? And I feel like it, it is, you know, it's a new one that many farmers haven't really had to maybe spend a lot of time thinking through. But again, as we saw today, what's coming you know, forward to the farming community um, is just gonna build and build and build. And working our way through all those choices um, is, is gonna be important. So again, um, technology needs to serve a purpose. We need to get out of the technology what you're investing and more, right? Um, most of us don't go out and buy a new tractor just because or, or any kind of equipment. Um, you know, there's always a business decision in, in the back of your mind or in the front and you penciled it out. You figured out if it makes sense. Um, and so again, it's really how can farmers access, access this type of decision-making tools? Um, and I believe that extension <clears throat> should serve this role or be a big part of it for our farmers um, throughout the United States. Okay, so besides all that, um, you know, again, a, a different example is about compatibility with the farmer itself. <laughs> um, and I'm laughing about that because you know, most of our farmers, as we already know, are in uh, older age demographic. And many of them, at least here in Vermont, don't, you know, they don't even have cell phones. Um, some of them don't even have answering machines, actually. So I wonder, oftentimes, um, even if, you know, a farmer is excited about new technology, is it going to be compatible with them? And it's not just putting the technology in their hands or on their farms, it's the training on how to use it. And I spent an entire day, <laughs> you know, with one of the farmers I work with, 
just trying to show them how to use a phone application. So, you know, some of this technology is really complicated and it's easy maybe to install or download the app, but then beyond that, who's there again to support these farmers as they begin to implement the technology and the tools on their farms? Um, you know, so the farmer may have a desire to adopt technology, but is it compatible with them? Are they willing to work with somebody and who is that person? to really learn how to use these tools so that they don't just invest in them monetarily and then end up not using them and gaining um, the benefits that we've all stated could be gained when they get to use these technologies. I thought about this a little bit um, and you can tell these are old pictures and some of them make me a bit sad. Some of these farmers aren't here anymore, um, but We've always talked of, you know, we always have our older, more seasoned farmers, you know, mentoring our, our younger farmers that are really, um, that really look up to some of our seasoned organic farmers. And I thought a little bit about, you know, is it time for that role reversal where some of our younger organic farmers may be able to help um, other, you know, other farmers with technology adoption. And I just threw this in there course, I think it's an important role for extension, but we have also, and we generally um, use our farmer collaborators to help us with education, outreach, and adoption, because they're the folks in the field using the tools. So the other thing to, to think about, of course, on the farm level is compatibility with existing equipment. Um, most of our farms, at least here in Vermont, have equipment that was produced prior to uh, a bag phone even, if anybody remembers those, <laughs> or maybe even a telephone in that, some cases. <laughs> but, um, you know, we have a lot of old equipment here, still works. You know, a lot of farmers proud of that tractor that they've had for 50 years. Um, but, you know, is their equipment actually compatible with some of the technology um, that's coming out on the marketplace? And so even though, you know, farmers want to adopt the technology it may actually mean that they have to make much, much bigger um, investments in other types of equipment like new tractors um, to be able to, you know, ha have some of that technology, you know, power supplies on a tractor, antennas, all these things. And, you know, you can buy, buy a piece of, you know, technology or, um, but then not really have the right equipment on your farm to be able to access it. And I'm laughing because I also worked with a farmer uh, for about a half a day to figure out how to mount um, a GPS unit on his 1980 Ford 8000 tractor. And he ended up you know, hiring somebody to build them a, a mounting um, structure. So these, are, this is real, right? Um, and then somebody already mentioned this the proprietary um, software and just these connections that most farmers don't really know or understand. Um, you know, most like a, most GPS systems that are sold by individual companies only fit, you know, or work on their tractors. Um, they can sell you a new tractor for sure, but, you know, even if you bring in an old model, they may say, well, you can't have access to this technology unless you have um, a newer tractor. And then of course, you may like, you know, company X's software or tools, but you own company Y equipment and they, don't, they aren't compatible. So, you know, there's a lot of limitations that farmers just don't really understand. Um, we have some farmers that are actually using two systems. They have one company's tractor, planner, the GPS unit for the planner, and then they go out and buy yet another monitor um, and aftermarket parts for the, the fertilizer component. And they weren't expecting to do that. Now, had somebody have been there to sort of guide them through this process, they probably would have spent far less money. So beyond just the equipment itself, there's so much more than that that needs to be considered. Um, you know, there's all this enhanced 
functionality with many of these tools and software packages, all this data. And for the farmers that I work with that are using um, various software packages and GPS systems and data collection, they have all this data. They don't have a clue what to do with it. And there's nobody there to help them. Because in a place like Vermont, there's like one dealer, you know, and that one dealer doesn't have time. Um, and also just, you know, sold the equipment. Um, so, you know, taking advantage of all that data means that you have to have an entirely different training process. And it often requires more money and more resources. Um, it's valuable. You could use it for a lot of things, but most farmers can't do that on their own. The other cautionary piece that I've learned working with farmers is that many of, of these units or programs or software, they're kind of sold with basic functionality and everything else are add-ons. Um, and I constantly feel like I'm playing one of those games you know, where you download this game on your phone and it's free. And then five minutes later, your child comes in and says, for $1.99, I can get the bonus pack. Um, and that's what I feel like a lot of this software and technology is, you know, it sort of gets this basic component, but then if you want any of the really cool stuff that you were hoping to do anyway with this technology, you got to pay more money for it. Um, so what are the true costs of all this technology? And I guess that's why I started my entire presentation saying, why do you want this? What's it going to do for your farm? You know? Is it going to solve a problem or are you just excited to try it out? Like really understanding where it fits, why you need it, making the right decisions so that you can get that return on your investment um, is something that isn't necessarily happening on many, many farms, especially, you know, the small, organic, medium-sized farms that I work with here in Vermont. So again, what are the true costs? You know, the equipment that you need, the retrofitting, the knowledge. Um, who's going to help you, you know, learn about all of this? In addition to that, one of the things that's been really interesting to me is that um, what I'm hearing from a lot of this sort of next generation on farms is that they don't want any more technology, that they're burnt out. Um, technology overload, even on arms, and they want to go back to just, you know, walking their fields, um, looking at their cows, things like that. And so I kind of wonder, we have more and more and more coming, information overload, um, and not a lot of technical service providers out there, especially within, you know, the land grant university system that are there to be able to help farmers walk through this very complicated and increasingly compl complicated decision that they are trying to make on their farm. Um, and so again, a lot of this is really food for thought. I think a little bit different than what we have maybe heard about today. Um, and I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks so much, Heather. I wonder if you're going to pop my face back on the screen. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that um, real world on farm, small farm, remote farm um, context that you provided. Um, we're gonna move on to our next speaker, <clears throat> Summer Sullivan. And she is a PhD student in the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research explores how the increasing use of high-tech digital farming devices is shaping labor, um, social, and environmental relations. She is also exploring the compatibility of ag tech and agroecology within California's ever evolving agricultural landscape. Summer also holds a master's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and has worked on various community led farming projects in California. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, you can start whenever you're ready. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, okay. 
I'm just trying to share my screen here. Okay, is that all good? Uh, no. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, hi everyone. My name is Summer Sullivan. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of California, Santa Cruz in uh, the Environmental Studies Department. Um, and I'm a social scientist, so I really study the people and politics of agriculture and technology. Um, and yeah, I think the intro did a really good job, but just want to reiterate, like I have a master's degree, but I also um, worked on a few different um, local and community farming operations in California Central Valley and the North Bay area. Um, and so today, as the talk of my title really suggests, I'm going to talk about the synergies and frictions of agroecology and ag tech. Um, and to do that, I'm going to be using a case study from my own campus. And this research um, was undertaken under the supervision of Julie Guffman, who we heard from um, a few presenters ago. And it's also um, funded by the National Science Foundation. So I think, you know, one of the main reasons that probably a lot of us are here today is there's all of these claims, right? The union of agroecology um, or organics and ag tech can provide a more sustainable farming future. Uh, but the compatibility of these things, like some other folks have been talking about today, is, is really untested. Um, and so just to give you a big, brief background on um, my project. Um, so I had a distinct opportunity um, starting in 2018. My campus um, at Santa Cruz um, really had this idea that they were going to start a campus-wide ag tech initiative. Um, and their goal was to bring together these really distinct um, uh, strengths in agroecology and engineering. Um, and it's important to note, so Santa Cruz has a really um, historical prominence um, of agroecology, one of the pioneers of agroecology in the US. Um, and engineering is a more recent strength, um, but really important to also note that my campus doesn't have um, agricultural engineering or agronomy. So the folks that I was talking to for my research um, had different backgrounds. Um, Oh, I think I actually met, yeah. And just really quickly, so I just wanna emphasize this was a, a real time sort of experiment to explore these compatibilities, which I think is a really unique opportunity. Um, and also I just wanna highlight a little bit of a spoiler alert. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how these two groups really couldn't even agree on the basic premise of their shared work. Um, but I'm going to end on a much more promising note um, as there were indeed some bright spots and areas for conversions. And I think you know, the reason that I'm here today, I do think this research has implications, you know, far beyond uh, my campus. So before diving into my findings, um, I do want to talk about, you know, how I'm thinking about agroecology and ag tech, because um, both sort of have multiple definitions that I can, you know, only briefly go into right now. But um, agroecology is sort of an approach that underpins organic and other diversified farming practices, right? Um, and it's also defined as a science practice and social movement. So some people are really interested in, you know, using it as an ecological approach to agriculture and only that. Other people are really interested in its origins and like indigenous practices. So incorporating some of the social, political and economic components of this farming practice as well. Um, and ag tech really isn't, you know, a distinct field in, a, in, in the same way as agroecology, but it indeed has a long history, right? Um, and Julie touched on some of this and other folks as well, but it includes like really basic tools, right? Like shovels and plows. Um, and in conventional farming practices, it really came to sort of connote technologies that increase productivity and efficiency. But, you know, today, I think the reason why most of us are here is because we're really thinking right now in the present moment about these, you know, high tech and digital devices, right? Like some of the things I have on the screen, um, you know, digital devices like drones and microbials. And just briefly, so the methods that I did um, to undertake this research. So I did this research during the pandemic. I conducted 23 interviews on Zoom um, between January and March 2021. And I was really talking to campus faculty and practitioners within the fields of engineering and agroecology who were either working on this ag tech initiative itself or perhaps had you know, vested interests given their research experiences or practice experiences. And obviously, 11 plus 7 does not equal um, 23. I also interviewed some social, social scientists, but I'm not going to um, include that data today. Um, so my findings, this is just a really brief overview of some of the things that I'm going to touch on. Um, and, and these really are sort of 
um, highlight the differences and the, and the ways that agroecologists and engineers were sort of thinking about and approaching their research and, and some of these different questions. So the first one that I wanna talk about is this, this very question of, you know, how did the agroecologists and engineers approach their research? Um, so the agroecologists really communicated like this wi wide or what they called a systems lens. Um, and this attention to sort of whole systems um, was obviously, you know, how they approach their farming practice, right? So really attuning to the complexity of biological organisms, the use of practices that were really going to foster, um, you know, species diversity and interaction between, between plants, you know, soil, microbes, and so on. Um, and I just want to really emphasize that this was sort of, their, their lens was much of a whole field lens and often even beyond, right? So thinking often about the communities where a farm might be located and even off farm nutrient cycling and like those types of questions. Engineers alternatively really wanted to sort of zoom in on specific on farm processes and phenomena. And one engineer that I spoke to said that, you know, the largely unpredictable nature of complex biological systems, which is really core to what the agroecologists sort of practice, right? Um, is actually their biggest challenge. And they said it gets in the way of increasing systems efficiency. And I, I think we've heard that word a lot today, you know, the goal of ag tech to increase efficiency, right? And so I think one way to sort of summarize this and, and sort of the, the, the narrower, more focused lens of the engineers and versus the wider systems lens of the agroecologist is like the plant versus field level. So agroecologists, again, are really looking at the full field. Engineers might be interested in a specific plant or an organism. And I think it's really important to note that, you know, no agroecologist that I spoke to thought of, you know, this, the lens that the engineers possess as inherently negative at all. They simply just said it had already caused, you know, some issues in their collaboration because basically the object of study, right, the whole field or, or a single organism or, or some much, much smaller sort of process, it just simply wasn't the same thing. Um, and so the next finding that I want to talk about deals with the ways in which engineers and agroecologists thought about food systems problems and solutions. So this, this really got to the core, basically, of what an ag tech initiative might be able to do, right? Um, and I have some quotes here. I'm not going to read them off, but I think they highlight each position quite well. So engineers really emphasize, you know, they're, they're trained to solve problems. Their entire field is trained to solve problems, usually with a technology. And one engineer sort of put this in a really um, colorful way. And they said, you know, if you aren't solving problems, you're just in the freaking mud. Um, and agroecologists, on the other hand, really saw food systems problems as super, super complex, right? Um, and they questioned sort of if ag tech could provide the solutions to the issues that they saw. And instead, um, you know, agroecologists really communicated that they were interested in these historically embedded approaches that really centered local and marginalized communities. And it's really important, again, to emphasize that these agroecologists were not anti-ag tech. They just simply did not see it as a silver bullet solution, but perhaps part of a bigger you know, mosaic of approaches to address these issues. Um, and so you know, engineers and agroecologists also deferred, for the most part, there's one, one point of convergence on this slide, and, and what they thought you know, could be useful types of ag tech. So for engineers, they were really interested in sort of like the high tech very sophisticated um, tools, right? So again, anything that might enhance the efficiency of agriculture, AI, machine learning, those types of tools. And useful for agroecologists, they really thought, you know, tools that could sort of center the health of farm workers, be easy to repair, which we've heard a lot today, um, and help with everyday, very practical farming tasks. So one example that was communicated to me by a few different agroecologists was, you know, a social platform to connect farmers and consumers. And I also emphasize, as we've also heard today, um, you know, the lack of ag tech that can really enhance biodiversity and support the cultivation of that. Um, but the one sort of source of agreement was around this affordable nitrogen sensor, right, um, to address the severe groundwater pollution and soil contamination that has been caused by um, conventional fertilizers. So, and we've also heard, you know, other people talk about sensors today. So I, I want to emphasize that as well. So the next finding deals with partners and beneficiaries. So, you know, everyone that I talked to agreed that our university and their collaborative, um, you know, would need to partner with, um, you know, outside partners, right? But they really disagreed on, on who those people or organizations might be. 
So engineers were, were really interested in sort of advancing and often patenting their research. And to do this, they wanted to partner with um, you know, these sort of big industry partners in the Silicon Valley and the Salinas Valley. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with California geography, Santa Cruz is actually sort of in the sweet spot right in between those two valleys. So Silicon Valley, really well known obviously for tech, um, and then the Salinas Valley is um, called the salad bowl basically of the world. It's an incredibly agriculturally prolific region um, that obviously has a lot of, lot of um, you know, ag tech companies um, that could be potential farmers. And so agroecologists, you know, largely just expressed um, some discomfort with these industry partnerships. And they sort of questioned the extent that the initiative could simultaneously, you know, engage with these small and diversified low resource farmers that they've historically worked with and whom they represent, while also pursuing, you know, these types of industry relationships. Um, and they also, you know, as we've heard today from different folks talking about open source, they really emphasize that, you know, any ag tech that they create as a public university should be publicly owned and widely available and contrast to the engineers, you know, not subject to the intellectual property rights and patents. Um, Agroecologists also expressed the concern that, you know, there really had been no engagement from the initiative with off-campus farmers and community members. And, you know, their question, as other people have asked, right, is, well, who's going to benefit from this then? So the next question that I want to, or the next point I want to talk about has to deal with questions of scale. And we've also heard this theme today, right? Um, scalability and what that might mean in small scale for organics, right? Um, so scale was sort of communicated to me in two different ways by my interview participants. Um, and one, the first way is in distribution and the second way is in applicability. So engineers were really interested in scaling up production and distribution for markets, and then getting that return on investment for the funders, right? Um, and one of the engineers said to me, you know, there's the research side of technology, and then there's those that need to make money um, from it, right, in developing it. Um, and they sort of summed up their position by saying, you know, the market is cruel, right? And agroecologists were, of course, aware of these, these concerns surrounding the market, but they sort of disagreed with the premise and thought that there might be a different way to, you know, distribute such a technology, right? And so the second use of scale had to deal with the potential applicability of any given technology. So one engineer said, you know, their discipline as a whole really takes a universalized approach to the application of technologies, you know, sort of saying like, context really matters. Um, and on the contrary, as many of you probably know, like for agroecologists, this context is central, right? Um, they really practice a place-based nature of agriculture and they attune their practices to specific locations and geographies. Um, and this means, you know, both, like I mentioned before, adhering to, you know, the biophysical complexities, but also socioeconomic complexities and cultural complexities of any specific location. And so, Coming toward the end of my, my talk here, I do want to highlight, you know, some, some, of, some of the brighter spots. So, um, you know, everyone that I talked to really agreed that there is this need for, um, you know, sustained communication and conversations, right? Um, and there was also agreement pretty much across the board that these conversations, like, won't be easy, right? The people engaging this initiative are very sort of aware of the differences that I've been highlighting for the most part, right? Um, and so they know that talking to one another is going to take time. Um, and they also offered, you know, ideas to address these challenges. Um, so agroecologists really suggested, you know, regular meetings with engineers to have conversations about goals and needs. Um, and they also said, you know, things like conferences can be great ways to sort of start these conversations, but there needs to be a mechanism to sort of sustain them. Um, and another agroecologist really emphasized the need to, you know, get into the nitty gritty, right? Um, so beyond surface level conversations, starting from scratch about, you know, what do we want the impact of this technology to be? What do we want the value of it to be? Um, and, you know, one engineer said, look, everyone is busy. And I think that's something we can all relate to, right? Um, and so they suggested like a physical space to sort of develop these communities so that everyone involved in the collaboration is sort of forced to take time away and sort of be in the present moment and engage in these really important discussions. So I just have a few concluding thoughts to wrap up. Um, you know, I'm the first to admit that overall, um, this, this presentation does not exactly paint a glossy picture of how engineers and agroecologists might work together. You know, our interviews really revealed some great differences in the findings that I highlighted today. So 
you know, approaches to research and how these groups are addressing problems, the appreciation of the, and the utility of ag tech, right? Who should be involved in these collaborations? Um, who this technology should benefit? And whether or not ag tech can even really meet the needs of small scale farmers. But there were still glimmers of promise. So both groups really agreed, you know, ag tech aimed towards small scale, low resource growers is really important. It would fill this niche that we've sort of all been talking about today. Um, you know, engineers might actually be really excited about the challenge of problem solving in a domain that values, you know, such multi-species complexity. Agroecologists might be really interested in collaborating on designing and experimenting with new tools that support farmers like themselves, right? Um, and so in conclusion, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts about, you know, what a successful multi-stakeholder and interdisciplinary project might look like, you know, beyond my campus community, right? Um, so just reiterating, I think, you know, difficult, uncomfortable conversations and discussions about values and goals need to be had at the outset, right? So before the train leaves the station, which I think is a problem that I see again and again. Um, and contributions from all collaborators, right, must be weighted in a symmetrical fashion. So whether it's a small farmer, um, you know, an agroecologist, an engineer, right, like this level playing field as much as that is possible. Um, so thank you all so much for your engagement um, with this presentation. And thanks, you know, to Jessica um, and all the others for their work in um, organizing this conference. It's been a real treat so far. So that's all I got. Thank you so much, Summer. That um, that was fantastic. And it's really important to understand the different perspectives um, between agroecologists and engineers so that we can develop um, effective partnerships and collaboration. So now we get to hear a little bit more about Open Team from Dr. Doran Cox. I know that Open Team has been referenced multiple times. So now you get to hear from Doran about it himself. Um, he is the research director and Open Team PI at Wolf's Next Center for Agriculture and the Environment. He co founded PharmOS, uh, the PharmOS software pl platform, the um, goat community, farm hack community, and he also lives and works on his family's 300 acre certified organic farm in New Hampshire. So Doran, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to be able to be here and part of this uh, really fantastic, uh, this uh, fantastic lineup. Uh, this is a topic that I'm obviously very passionate about. Um, and I'm hoping that today uh, a lot of what we're talking about here with uh, Open Team really ties together a number of the perspectives that we've heard throughout the day, both the optimism and some of the challenges of really getting the most out of uh, technology. Um, uh, from my perspective, we're really asking a lot more from agriculture, uh, not only to provide food, fiber, and energy, uh, but also uh, to increasingly provide uh, climate mitigation and biodiversity and uh, um, and water quality and quantity and really managing these larger systems and creating public goods. Um, and that requires a different sort of uh, emphasis. Uh, agriculture as uh, not an individual enterprise, but as a shared human endeavor, uh, a multi-generational systems uh, and public science, and that requires new uh, structures, just like uh, as we're, you know, decoding the human genome or doing deep, deep, deep space exploration, quite wide scale, large scale collaboration. Um, and, and so I, I think that's the, the exciting opportunity as we shift and look at organic agriculture and technology and shifting the narrative from just feeding the world uh, to stewarding the environment to produce healthy, uh, to health and abundance for all. Um, and, and so that's really the foundation for uh, the creation of uh, Open Team. Um, and I have the pleasure of, uh, of working uh, at Wolf's Neck Center for Agriculture and the Environment on the coast of Maine, where a lot of these systems, this sort of broader definition of agriculture come together. And we host uh, again Open Team. And I'll, I'll go through the acronym because I think it's really important uh, to uh, to just, and it does a fairly good job of describing uh, what what it is and what we're trying to accomplish uh, together. Um, open, as you've heard together, is really important to build uh, trust and because of the scale of collaboration, 
uh, an individual, you could produce the technology, but with, if it isn't open, it's not uh, possible to be built upon. Um, and then uh, likewise, it's a technology ecosystem because it's not just the technology, it's the communities that are uh, that that uh, make it work together. Uh, technology is a byproduct of our shared efforts. And then uh, agricultural management, uh, because ultimately uh, agriculture and what, uh, it needs to be applied and the tools and technologies that we use need to be accessible uh, uh, at all levels to essentially for all uh, farmers, regardless of scale or production system, geography, culture, uh, or language. And so that's uh, sort of the, the, the very big ambition that we have uh, is creating an applied uh, science. So we're now, uh, so Open Team was formed initially by a collection of that ecosystem of the foods uh, in this uh, system that is, isn't, is not just an individual farm operation, but really looking at the larger collaborative effort that's necessary to support the kind of agriculture that, uh, that will be necessary to meet the needs. And that includes farm and ranch networks, uh, food companies, uh, government agencies, technology providers, environmental marketplaces, research universities, uh, and uh, we've had significant support from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture uh, Research uh, as well to, again, start to build a, a pre-competitive or collaborative, uh, I'd say, uh, approach to building the common infrastructure that's necessary to support uh, the future agriculture and recognizing, again, that we need to do this uh, and, and the, some of the tensions that were brought up today uh, that uh, agriculture from its very local individual enterprise level and all the nuances there to really some of these global public goods and global context that we're also trying to capture and, and, and share and, and uh, navigate the tools and technologies that go from our local observations that are very specific to those that are really global and universal. And we're really capturing a lot of that uh, in this intersection of individual management and and the shared environment uh, and the land stewardship that uh, that's involved. Uh, I actually just threw this slide in in the last uh, as we were going through today because I thought it was really relevant as we're talking about technology being neutral, and it made me think of this uh, uh, quote uh, and the paper from Langdon Winner uh, in 1980 about the politics of artifacts, and in fact that the tools that uh, we use and create are a product of the systems and the communities that create them and the power dynamics that, we, that are a reflection uh, of who we are and who we want to be. Uh, and so, uh, the, uh, you know, whether we're producing nuclear power plants or low cost handheld uh, soil uh, moisture meters or carbon meters uh, or, you know, water quality testers that are $60,000 and only specialized labs can access, all of those things are a product of what our vision is for the future and how we want to collaborate and work together. So I, I think there is a there's a there's a there's a, a real power in taking control and recognizing that uh, again the technologies are are not necessarily uh, neutral. They uh, they do have uh, embody our vision for the future. Um, and so I, in that line, part of the, the foundation for Open Team is also to move from the concept of precision agriculture uh, and the focus on automation and the action-based tools and technologies we've heard about, the things that just take action on the environment, to the decision ag, which is really the human part of making better decisions from observations and, and anal uh, analysis and communications, all of which are other parts of the tools and technologies that we can steward together and to democratize access to that agricultural knowledge that can feed into automation systems. You know, a weed, weed identifier works for a robot or it works for a person. Uh, and and that, that we really build into our structure that technologies and uh, in, that will work at all scales and are built from the ground up to, uh, to cut across cultures and geographies and, um, and that that is something that we can embody in our engineering philosophy. And so we see with organizations like Open Team, Farm OS, or FarmHack, or GOAT, uh, this uh, much longer term agrarian principle 
of uh, open knowledge exchange. Uh, this uh, image on the right was in a 1918 Sears and Roebuck uh, Encyclopedia of Practical Farm Knowledge, uh, you know, tr describing the uh, community club system, things like uh, the Farmers Alliance and the Grange that were really influential in the early part of the century in, in uh, a circulatory system of ideas and information and inspiration through a, a social knowledge exchange system. And that's something that we can, that I think we're building upon uh, and sort of reinvigorating with open source tools. And you see that sort of, you know, the, the, the Wikipedia of uh, effect uh, in some sense. And there's a, a deep history of tying that back uh, even further in terms of how we document and use technology to exchange our knowledge. So we have an incredible array of tools and uh, technologies at our fingertips, but as we've heard, a lot of them don't work together. They weren't designed as a, a coherent ecosystem from, from the farmer's or land steward's perspective. They're in pockets in proprietary tools with, uh, 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 with uh, companies or, or within uh, government agencies or within research universities. And so our community is really about bringing those together uh, into a coherent ecosystem because again, a technology ecosystem means an interoperability means working together. That means that people working together creates tools and technologies that work together. Uh, and that's part of the design from the ground up. Um, I'll, I'll add here that a, a key uh, theory of change uh, with an open team also is that the technology is just part of a larger context and that the change requires much more than technology. And it's not appropriate in some sense to, to lay that on an individual producer's doorstep. As we've heard from Heather and many others, uh, the navigation of appropriate access to tools is, is a burden and, you know, and in fact, it, it is a shared endeavor. And so that we have a much larger community in agriculture than just the land stewards that uh, can be brought in to support. So part of it is access to open tools and correctly uh, matching and co-creating uh, tools with the land stewards, but it's also creating the appropriate decisions support and the connections and access to uh, environmental markets and peer-to-peer -peer connections and knowledge sharing and social platforms for reinforcing feedback for engagement. Uh, but it's also uh, creating the mechanisms to share the skills to use these new tools. Uh, and that's a social process. It can be facilitated by technology, but it's also creating social structures to support that. And then uh, likewise, it's, it's about uh, creating social connections and role models so we can see the future, we can see examples of success and what that looks like as we're connecting on a personal level and building communities around these uh, tools and technologies. And so again, that's part of Open Team's structure at its foundation is yes, it's technology and, and creating a coherent ecosystem uh, but it's also the human-centered design process that uh, Ankita talked about, and then sharing and what's common globally, and then also building local networks to share what's unique uh, and site-specific and to help sort of decommodify and, and uh, our products, uh, and then also link them to uh, the global, global context. And so again, this it comes into focus as we're looking at a development of uh, very rapid, low cost in field sensors. But again, those are just a, a reflection of a smaller part of the larger, uh, the larger ecosystem uh, to drive and provide, again, this, uh, this global public good of knowledge uh, to the site specific decision uh, tools that can be used uh, appropriately at the farm level. So this is an example of uh, uh, one of our, our research uh, director at Wolf's, our research on site research director, Leo Perot, using one of uh, our size uh, in field uh, rapid soil carbon measurement tools. Um, but this again has to be applied in, in a unique environment. So, part of Open Team is creating a network of diversified production systems uh, that can create affinity while also connecting uh, where there's universal uh, connections. Um, and we were building uh, working groups that again, look at technology as a certainly important piece, but lining that up with the available science, connecting with the hubs and networks, creating system-centered design, 
And then very importantly, I think this equity and in, uh, in practice group that's really amplifying the work of our members and supporting uh, inclusion, uh, because if the technology isn't accessible, we're actually not going to meet, meet the needs uh, and we're not going to change agriculture in an appropriate direction. We're also creating uh, problem solving groups that can that connect across these different boundaries of affinity groups. Uh, and very much like the hackathons, but sustained efforts over uh, three to eight weeks uh, to address common challenges across our hubs uh, from creating a common uh, a community platform uh, designed to soil carbon measurement to addressing measurement in agroforestry to creating a digital ag wallet, which we're talking about, uh, and, and so forth. Each of these come from our communities and uh, drive our, the agendas uh, and then the actionable output. So ultimately, I think, you know, as we're looking at tools and technologies, the, uh, we have to really look again at participation and trust and, uh, and data sovereignty and control. Uh, I think as we have more powerful technologies, who controls them becomes increasingly uh, important uh, and creating uh, tools that build trust uh, rather than are coercive is particularly uh, important for the long-term success of, uh, of these new markets. And so we have a, a mantra with an open team from the, that producers should own their own data. Uh, but what that really means is, uh, is actually uh, about data sovereignty and control and who can access it and how and when uh, and creating tools that allow for very transparent consent management and the ability uh, in, as we're developing this concept of an ag data wallet, that a producer can enter data once and use it many times, but it means if others are, are gathering data on their operation, that they retain control of that and it's retained in their wallet. And then that's a, a key for their identity and ability to access uh, the global knowledge uh, system, both contribute to public science. So copies of their data can be shared uh, with their control, but also they can have access to information that's necessary to drive their private enterprise. So both private enterprise and public science are compatible. And the key here is that the data we collect at the farm level uh, for our own agronomic purposes uh, is actually Did we lose Dorn? Yeah, it looks like oh. he may have been disconnected there. Let's see if we can get him back on. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that little hiccup. I was just uh, saying that uh, you know the data we collect for our organic certification is incredibly detailed and valuable, uh, a higher level resolution often than is, uh, is asked for from a research and development perspective. Uh, it, uh, and, and if we can collect it for agronomic purposes rather than just for certification and auto populate our certification programs, uh, or digital certification as a possibility, we can uh, really increase the value of our observations on farm. And then ultimately we have these new marketplaces that are about the, the environmental outcomes, the, the sort of the land, the attributes of our land that improve over time, uh, uh, carbon sequestration, water quality and quantity that are really all about the data that we're collecting on a daily basis for our own operations. So there's the potential again, for entering data once, use it many times, but we need to be in control of that. Uh, and that's that's where we can build structures to do that. This is what we're doing with across the open team ecosystem with a number of the folks who've already presented. Uh, so we can enter data for decision reasons, for certification, uh, enterprise budgets, or nutrient management, or soil health plans, or specialty crop planning. Uh, store that in our wallet, share it in uh, different ways, uh, both for creating uh, data cooperatives or unions, uh, and then being able to access uh, uh, and share with one another, not only in markets, but peer-to-peer -peer exchange and begin sharing more detailed information about our operations that decommodify what we're producing. In some sense, an organic certification is a commodification of a claim, but we can start to show the details of where are we? What's the context in which we're producing the products? Uh, What's the history and human history of the land? What's the 
what are the social practices, all of those can become shareable. Uh, and then part of what we're working on is things like a coffee shop that also allow us to find other farms and converse with them. Uh, and so this tech stack uh, is really important. This open agricultural knowledge tech stack is a number of tools uh, that are together uh, offer access to the global sort of uh, common knowledge system, but also uh, protection and uh, create data sovereignty, but also apps for uh, things like organic certification or grazing management. Uh, and then ultimately uh, brought together so that you know the, the vision here, uh, of course, is that we've got millions of years of shared evolution at our fingertips uh, in our seeds, breeds, and technology, and we have uh, tools to communicate uh, and exchange what that looks like. Uh, but it's a tool that's less than ten thousand days old, uh, and so our opportunity is uh, to create a vision for how we use our combined abilities to. Uh, translate that into a regenerative future. So we, uh, he is really uh, designing that together. So we really invite you to participate and thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Dorn. I feel like this conference has been this roller coaster starting with, you know, opportunities and potential pitfalls. And then you gave this perfect example about how these tools are being developed really well, um, you know, with open source technology, um, human-centered design, et cetera. So thanks so much for sharing that. And now we're gonna hear from farmers who are gonna talk about their experiences with ag tech, um, the challenges that they experience where ag tech has been or could be useful, aspects they'd like to see when it comes to ag tech and more. Um, we have five farmers who recorded their thoughts. So we are gonna go ahead and roll their recordings. I'm Nate Powell Palm, and I'm a grain farmer based out of Bozeman, Montana. I raise oil seeds and pulse crops and cereal grains, as well as certified organic beef cattle. Um, I've been certified organic since 2008 and have been a, um, a deep fan of the idea of ag tech and, um, and also um, a fan of making it better. And so uh, I was excited about this discussion where we get to kind of um, talk about and ideate on this idea of how do we make organic farming um, a better target for ag tech development? How do we get folks to develop tools that are actually useful to us? Um, and so I've been uh, looking at how we as organic producers uh, consistently are required to use a lot of different forms and a lot of different data gathering um, pieces for our organic systems plan. And I've often thought that that is just such a perfect opportunity for someone developing record keeping tools or agronomy management software um, to integrate those organic systems plans since we already are required to um, articulate and upload so much information. But I've been surprised that so few apps are really specifically targeted at organic and specifically at organic field production. So grains, forages, um, kind of that more commodity style production. Um, so we use a lot of spreadsheets on our farm. Um, it's not anything fancy, but it definitely works for us. That being said, as we um, try to dial in our efficiencies, um, small things like time tracking and being able to identify which fields performed well, um, you know, throughout a number of different reasons and given number of different variables, um, all of that is, is a little trickier to capture when we're doing it so we're more manually using spreadsheets. So we do have GPS on our farm and we're able to capture quite a bit of data through that. But I think that there's just this fantastic opportunity for easy to use, mostly smartphone based apps um, to step into the space and look to um, work with certifiers to ultimately more um, automate the organic system plan make it easier to use, really identify though what data is super important to organic farmers. We don't need a bunch of spray data because we don't necessarily use or can't use those synthetic sprays that are um, uh, targeted by that, that data collection, that software. So we need folks looking to help us gather data, track data that is actually useful <clears throat> for our decision making. 
when we look at um, what parts of the production are also really tricky, I find that that the post harvest, so sort of when I hit the field with the combine through sale, from a record keeping point of view and a um, an integration of technology point of view, it's kind of a black box. We, we don't have a lot of good software out there to help track um, inventory and storage, which fields went into which bins, uh, making that traceability all that more easy to, to identify, to work with, and ultimately to leverage when you're going to sell your grain or your hay um, or your other goods. Um, I think the other piece of ag tech that I'd really like to see tackled is, and this is very specific, but cattle identification. I think that when we look at the, the myriad of ways that cattle are traced back um, from sale back to organic origination, um, there's a lot of um, improvisational record keeping, um, but also just a lot of missed opportunity for making that process really easy and helping folks um, utilize you know, the RFID tech out there and, um, and make it specific, more specific to organics. I would love to see certifiers encouraging um, producers to try to engage a little bit more in electronic herd keeping records. I realize there's a wide spectrum of farmers who are in the dairy and beef space um, in, in organics, but I think that there's some really cool opportunities where we could be leveraging how much data we already keep and making it into a more digestible, easy to use format. Um, I wish there was better tech for that post-harvest period, but I also wish that there was just uh, better tech all in all that integrated well with our respective organic system plans, which means that probably is the case, software developers couldn't necessarily just be making an organic um, piece of software, but they'd have to actually work with specific certifiers. Um, and wouldn't that be fun to have certifiers um, with, you know, relationship with, with good backend software developers to make really useful tech. I know there are folks out there doing that. I would just love to see more of it um, and have it target more specific questions about production, not just try to be a blanket um, record keeping app or data gathering for just all organics. Farming is so specific that you wouldn't make just a farming app for all of agriculture, but you're going to make one more specified or more um, customized to grain or to forage or to vegetables. And so I'd love to see that within the organic software space as well. Hi, my name is Phil LaRock and I've been a farmer, an organic farmer, for almost 50 years. So I have to admit in the early days there wasn't a whole lot of help for an organic farmer, so I developed a lot of farming techniques on my own. So I've become a little stubborn, and I guess you can say, in looking at new stuff. However, with climate change coming in and a water shortage here in California, labor shortage, I do recognize that uh, technology and science has its place. I sometimes, as an old school guy, do see that some of science and technology hasn't always been perfect, so I do have that little negative side of me that keeps uh, my eyes wide open. But my plea here would be, I do see the need for some future technology, especially in measuring irrigation water and precision technology and running your spray rig through your vineyard, your orchard, what have you. But with that said, you must make it user friendly. A lot of the stuff that I have attempted has got to be used through a computer or your iPhone, your iPad, and it's just not my forte. My son and my kids are taking over the vineyard for me. My son is 50, my son in law is 48, and they are also in the same place where they're just a little fearful of new technology having to use the computer. So, again, I see the value of computer technology, I see the value of ag technology but you must make it easy and user-friendly. Thank you.
welcome to Francis Flowers and Herbs Farm and the home of Pure Sine All Natural Hair and Skincare Products and our Biodynamic Training Institute. We follow the farming practice of Dr. George Washington Carver and Dr. Rudolf Steiner. Dr. George Washington Carver taught us perfect farming methods in the 1800s in this country. Dr. Rudolf Steiner taught us perfect farming methods in Germany. Both their practice taught us how to remineralize the earth in order for us to live in harmony with nature. And that's the type of farming my husband and I do at Francis Flowers and Herbs Farm. Technologies that we have used that we have found very beneficial in remineralizing the earth is the field broadcaster. The field broadcaster uh, was created to help the earth heal much faster than it normally would. My husband is going to explain to you exactly how this field broadcaster works on your soil. Purpose of the dynamic field broadcaster is to induce energy patterns into the atmosphere and into the ground. This is done with the use of this device. What we do is have the soil tested by our radion. Those are made into reagents. Say we're deficient in boron. So after the test, we determine that we're deficient in boron. Our radionic specialist determines that after a series of tests that she performs. Once that is done, she gives us the results. And what we do is we send those results to make a reagent, which is a little vial of nutrients that we put into the field broadcaster. We put in a top well and a bottom well. Once they are introduced inside, the subtle self-driven energy patterns of the broadcaster will mimic the patterns of the nutrients that are missing into the atmosphere and into the ground. This device has a range of over 2,000 acres and there's also another device that I make that's larger and it has a range of 4,000 acres. To understand how this works, it goes into uh, higher sciences like uh, physics of quantum mechanics, uh, zero point field theory, and my mentor, Hugh Level, he displays it perfectly. He calls it non-localized quantum entanglement, which simply means that everything is connected. It's our Vortex Brewer. And our Vortex Brewer was created by Steve Stout, a great biodynamic practitioner of over 40 years. He created the compost tea for the brewer. And the brewer actually holds 30 gallons of water. And what we do is we take the compost tea, put it in the brewer and brew it up. And then we take it and put it in sprayers and buckets and we use it on our flower beds. We can, you can spray your whole lawn with it. Anything, your fruit trees, anything on your land, you can spray with this compost tea. And that way you are know for sure that you're remineralizing the, your soil. And he has also everything in that kit that your soil needs to be re remineralized. I'd love to share with you how our herb garden look in the fall. How beneficial are still buzzing around our medicine basil. I would love for you to see it. This garden 
where I'm standing was created in honor of our ancestors. I truly believe that we need to respect and honor the farmers that came before us and taught us everything that we know. So let's go into the inside of the herb garden. The tree you see here is our marengo tree. The seeds came from Africa. And in this area, it's a lot of medicine baser. During the day, the beneficial are all over it. I think we might still be able to see a few. It's kind of late in the afternoon and they might all be gone by now. But if we was here about one, two, three o'clock, they were just buzzing everywhere. So this is my medicine garden that was created in honor of the ancestors. I see a bumblebee bee over there on that medicine baser. My husband might be able to capture it for you. But you can see the beneficial really comes to the herbs and to the flowers. They really love them. It's a good way to regenerate and replenish your garden by bringing in lots of herbs and lots of flowers they will totally bring in the beneficial that you need for your garden this is a spearmint bed that we have in the back and over here is some turmeric that I harvested yesterday. It's really beautiful. And over here, is a small garden for fall of fall greens that we planted for this fall. We have in our garden, we have lettuce, we have spinach, we have arulica, we have onions there, we have collard greens here, we have kale, we have mustard greens, and we have Chinese mustard greens. Over here we have carrots, beets, broccoli, and radish over here. I would like to say in closing that it is so important, very, very, very important that we communicate with our land, that we sit on our land and we get to know our land and that we reconnect again because water and the land is our life support system. Without those two things, we would not exist. So we really need to remineralize the earth because we have used so many chemicals, especially in this country, to deplete the soil over the years. Unless we remineralize the soil, our life force is not there. I truly believe when we truly remineralize our soil, our health will improve tremendously. So let us get busy helping other farmers. If we have technology that we know that's gonna enrich someone's life, let's get busy helping spreading the word. This year, we received a grant from the NRCS department to help other farmers to learn biodynamic practice that we have been practicing for 17 years. And we have involved people in our community, the Milestone Co-op and the Boys and Girls Club. We've actually taught them to farm biodynamically. That was a huge, huge help for us, having those, that money to train children and grown-ups who will not have been able to participate and buy the nutrients that we supplied to them. So they got a year supply of biodynamic nutrients to put on their land. And we're so grateful for that. But I truly believe if you do your life purpose and you present it to the world, then the world will help you spread it. So thank you so much for listening to me and my husband. Peace and blessings from Francis Flowers and Herbs Farm.
Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota. I have been farming in the U.S. a little bit over four years, but technically I been in the farming industry for four years before I came to the United States as well. And I start my farming business in 2018. I start with quarter acre when I first joined Bing Real Farms organic training program in 2018. And I start from one quarter acre and the following years in 2019, I increase into one acre followed by two acre and third year is three acre. And this is my four year and three and a half acre. I technically grow uh, organic fresh produce such as bok choy, uh, lettuce, salad mix. Also you try some, I classify myself as specialized in growing Asia grain. I like Chinese kale, Chinese bakery, and also Chinese vegetables such as uh, you try some and also monster and green. I always looking for opportunity to apply for grant and I just work with local organization or local co-ops, whoever giving out grants to small scale farmer, I just apply. I would like to share about if you start farming and also approach any organization in your area and ask for this to see if they have any grant opportunity, even as little as 500, 1000 or even more and take advantage of that. Even small amounts still help you buy small too, small equipment or help you uh, start your online platform to sell online. That's, that's why I approach, I approach living co-ops and to apply for small wall behind tractor, uh, wall behind cultivator, and also uh, three rows jam cedar. And I got it from uh, living co-ops. And this year, I also applied for a grant through um, Mel City Next Step grant. And I applied for a uh, plastic lifter and wider because I'm doing plastic mulch. And by the end of each season, I have to lift all the plastic and toss into uh, garbage dumpster. So using him, it will take a lot of um, leveling and time consuming. So that's why I applied for the plastic lifter and I got a grant. And that is 4,800 for a plastic lifter from Telmo. And I, I always encourage each of you who are a small farmer and looking for opportunity in any of your local organization and apply for a small grant. What program did you use at foreign access to technology? As I mentioned, um, just talk to your local farm agency. They always have grant available even through your farmer markets or churches and always apply for it. And the next question, what could you make it easier for small scale farmer to assess technology? I would say start with any two that you think it will help you to increase your production and always look for equipments and technology because technology is the only thing that you can uh, use to improve your efficiency and less labor, but you still be, um, be capable to manage under two acre, three acre with a few, um, a few members in your team. Next question is, what kind of technology do you wish you have access to as a farmer? I would recommend if you're doing a small scale farming, a gen seeder is, is a must because gen seeder is very precise and you can do either gen seeder 
JP1, one row, or JP3, JP4, whatever. But the James Seeder is a game changer. It help you um, do a direct C for Kerak and other um, small C. And it's very accurate and give you a straight line when you do cultivator, when you do a cultivation, it allow you to use the well holes or R2 and go very fast on between the aisle of the plant or between row. On top of that, I also would like to introduce um, BCS wall behind tractor because without a uh, two well tractor, when you terminate your crop, you prep for your new bed and you don't really have equipments or equipment to help you chop down the um, the the uh, terminate the the uh, residue uh, left over and it is a must to have a two well tractor such as the BCS and have a teller um large teller and also have a um, trail mower because you need to mold all left over and you can tell so even you don't have a big tractor as long as you have two well tractor with lottery power and also um, the film mower, you will be able to manage under three acre. What are the biggest challenges you face as a farmer? I would say um, small farmer, the challenge is about marketing because if you aggregate your produce into um, a farmer market and if you are new and sometimes you don't get into a busy uh, farmer market because not many people leave the farmer market and uh, they have limited spot and is is challenges to get into a busy uh, farmer's market so uh, i i start with more i find my market I start with small farmer market because I start from small. I don't necessarily to go to a very busy farmer market. But once I have a knowledge and skill to manage small um, farmer market and have the skill to build my competition, my um, competence about uh, serving customer, organize your produce at the farmer market, have a good regular keeping about your sale inventory then you can start apply for a um, busier farmer market. And I would say start to get to know the farmer market's manager. And even you cannot become a full-time vendor, you can start as once a while or occasionally once a, once a month or um, why would they have slob and just go? At least you get to know the manager of the farmer market and also get to know your customer at that particular farmer market and later on you know the manager and if any vendor leave the market they will accept you to become a vendor a full-time vendor what technology might not exist yet that you think would be helping helpful for organic farming I would say this is a very good question. Uh, there are always technology that very advances and very make a game changer. I would say that technology could be green harvester, green, green harvester with certain bucket and also had a build drive and really help you to have a um, salad mix or green mix because salad mix is high high value crop but it take a lot of time to do um, using hand or even the green harvester baskets and with the drill too is not quite efficient but i prefer to have a two well um, drive and have a bucket and you can harvest as a um, build drive and also um, harvest a lot per square acre or square uh, footage there'll be a game changer and i would like to see 
because right now a lot of company develop a small tool for small scale farming and they're still on the developing of um, a tool to help harvest salad mix and hopefully pretty soon we will get that on the market. And that's pretty much about myself and please feel free to reach out to me through uh, my email uh, coolhang2005 at yahoo.com and I think Jessica will also post my contact on uh, full touch of the this video as well and reach out to me I'm more than happy to share my organic farming skill in terms of developing your business um, sales uh, strategy as well as more too to help you be success on your journey as become a small scale farmer or market gardener and thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to share my skill um, through uh, this program thank you and good luck everyone For, I think for the organic farmer it needs to be a little different than for the conventional farmer. So you see so many of these big conventional farms and technology replaces humans in a big way. Shouldn't be so you can sit in your office and manage everything and, and not ever go out and do your job. So, you know, all it's been really intended to for me is to focus on spots that I need to really focus on. So it should be a, an aid to fine tuning your management. It shouldn't be your management. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm John Banson. I'm an Organic Valley dairy farmer in Monmouth, Oregon. We milk uh, about 170 cows, 170 Jersey and Jersey Cross cows. Um, and we manage 600 acres of, uh, of grass ground, uh, pasture ground um, to feed those cows, both, both grazed and some harvested for wintertime feed. Um, I farm with my two sons. My oldest has been back on the farm for nine years and is uh, in line to take take over the farm here in not too terribly long in time. Um, my wife, uh, Julie, and I have uh, started the farm 30 years ago and switched over to organic production 21 years ago now. Um, so we've, we've been on this uh, journey of uh, higher intensity grazing for quite a few years. And that's where this technology that we are now using, that we're, we're part of the pilot project uh, with Organic Valley on, on this grazing satellite technology is, is really fit into the farm. Um, we've been doing this, uh, it's been ongoing maybe three or four years now that we've been participating in this and getting the data back and now uh, this last year has been really about fine tuning it with Organic Valley. And it's just uh, a group of satellites that that, uh, that cruise over the earth all the time in line and take uh, copious amounts of photographs of, of all the land has enabled us to be able to see our farm a lot uh, from the sky to see what, what's being seen from there and, and which enables us to kind of see the any trouble spots we have on the farm, any place irrigation has missed because we're in a Mediterranean climate here in Oregon and we have to rely on some irrigation. For me, it's not really meant to replace my boots on the ground. It's meant to help me focus on what I really need to be looking at. Um, so we get these reports weekly. Uh, that come via email and what we see in these reports is our actual farm we see the farm map uh, of our place with all the pastures that are being being uh, studied by the satellite data and it reads out for us uh, showing the darker the green the more forage is out there uh, and so a dark green means those pastures are about ready to graze. Uh, the lighter they get into a light yellow uh, means 
that um, we've just grazed them. Now, uh, a red color means either it's ground that's been worked. So as we replanted a field this year, you can see immediately uh, the one field was bright red because there was absolutely nothing on that field. Also, any little corners of the farm that uh, in the summertime may not have irrigation, you'll see turn red as well because there's absolutely zero chlorophyll uh, being produced on those spots. You should have always have about a third of your farm just grazed, so it should be in the yellow. A third of the farm uh, partially grown back, which should be a light green, and then a third of the farm dark green, and that's that's because we rotate our cows through the pastures uh, on a on a regular basis. Every 12 hours, they get a fresh piece of grass. You'll also see if there's streaks of a lighter color in some of the fields and some of it's darker, that might be where there's either irrigation issues or uh, this past year we had a vole issue. The little secret is if everything's looking good on top of the ground from what I'm seeing on these uh, satellite technology photos, uh, means we're doing a good job in the ground as well. Uh, so, so that dark green and having that dark green come back and back and back all season long means we have a really healthy uh, biological system in the soil, which is what really drives our entire system because uh, uh, microbe driven system, both in the ground and in the cows. And so that's something we really need to focus on. And, and so it really, it really helps correlate the, uh, made the, the grazing management decisions with what we're doing in our soils as well. It didn't change the weather for us. It did allow us to see the f effects of that weather a lot sooner than we normally would, because that's really one of the important things is seeing the trends. However, sometimes as a farmer, just because you're seeing the trend doesn't mean you can do anything about the trend too. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the things we need to realize that, yeah, technology is great, but in the end of the day, Mother Nature is going to what is going to be what really rules us. The technology helped us see what was happening to us, and maybe what it'll help is in the future seeing how maybe we can respond a little differently than what we did. I just want to hop on real quick and say that I know we are running over. Um, we are going to end up cutting the last discussion sessions. This is our last talk, so if you can, stick around for it. Um, otherwise, you can watch the recording later. So thanks, everyone. Um, and Amber, you can go ahead and introduce her. Thank you so much. And I also just wanted to note that we are so grateful for the farmers who are able to participate in this. Um, not only is it a treat, but it is really valuable for us to be able to see farms, to hear firsthand about what some of the successes are and some of the challenges. So thank you so much to those who, um, who made some videos for us. So our last speaker is Dr. Paula Rama, who is a PhD in computer vision and machine learning. Um, she also has a master's degree and a bachelor's in electrical engineering. And the main objective of her research has been to develop intelligent systems or, and machines um, that can understand and recreate the visual world around us to solve real world problems. Um, since 2004, she has been researching integrated engineering technologies, mostly in the field of computer vision, robotics, and machine learning as it's applied to agriculture. And she has deployed multiple smart low T, low cost and edge computing technologies that can be operated by non-technical people, which we've heard is <laughs> a real need. Um, and also her technologies can be used in a wide range of rugged and critical field conditions like that we find on the farm. So um, I think that we actually, Paula was not able to join us now. So we have a recording, I believe that we can just get started.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here in this great event. Uh, my name is Paula Ramos, I'm computer vision and machine learning scientist, uh, former researcher at NCSU in North Carolina State University. And today, um, I want to tell I want to tell you uh, some of the results that I that I got in my previous research. Um, so I have 17 years of experience working working in between uh, engineering and agriculture and trying to improve the adoption of the technologies around the around my projects. So today um, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to show you my results related with smart IoT and low cost systems to bridge the technology gap in agriculture. So today we will talk about uh, some aspects about uh, my um, previous projects um, and also how we were working with the project of precision sustainable agriculture that I, I can imagine that you that you have heard about this project today. So we also uh, talk about we will talk about smarter agriculture with artificial intelligence that is pretty important. We will talk about the machine learning, IoT, and low-cost uh, sensors. Um, so let's start. And I think that for you is 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 a, is a reality, and that you know the impact of this big challenge that we have as a as a as a human humanity. Uh, we have um, this big challenge to feed uh, more than ten billion people by 2050 and this is huge challenge if we have if we take a look of the things that are happening today with the use of the water the herbicide resistance of the weeds the climate change and one of the things that we are doing as an engineers is we are trying to understand better what is the relation between environment environment genetics and yield that relation, but we want to put the technology uh, to to help and improve this um, this big challenge that we have. And and as as I told you, this is a reality, um, and we have different kind of challenges in, regarding weeds and the and the stress of the plants, and we were working so hard uh, with different technologies that we made uh, in the past three years to uh, mon monitorize the weeds in the field and also detect the water stress for soybean and cotton mainly. Mm, and that is, that is a, a, a big deal for us, it was a big deal for us because we needed to find something functional, something simple to use, low cost and easy to maintain. And this is, these are the three basic axes that I have in my researchers. So I, 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 was, I was thinking that the most complicated things, maybe the fancy things could be great in the engineering world, but the, the functionality is the most important thing for us. So if we are deploying a deep learning model that in the paper has 90% of accuracy is great, but when you need to put that deep learning algorithm inside of a system and just use this deep learning as a production system, the functionality and the and the accuracy could be decreased, and, and the the value of the decrease is could be could be could be uh, huge. So for that reason, we need to put in a balance the functionality and and the the fancy things and the technologies. So it's better to see something simple but with a great functionality. So. And another thing that is pretty important is in the conditions that we are talking about. So our, our environment is not the best one. So we have a lot of complex conditions. When we talk about, um, when we talk about the complexity related computer vision and machine learning, you can imagine that we have uh, a lot of elements in the same image. So we have we can see weeds, we can see cover crops, we can see plants, we can see soil, but also we can see overlighting, we can see the shadows, 
because of the canopy. And that is a complex problem. And we have the engineering behind the computer trying to understand the problem. But the engineer also need the background of the uh, agriculture. So that is a complex from problem for the engineer, but also if we put the agronomists or the biologists to work with the uh, deep learning algorithms and these kind of things, also it's a complex project problem for, for, for them. So for that reason, we need to put together in the same page, the engineer and the agronomist to work together and see the complex of the problem. So for that reason, it's pretty important to create this precision framework when we can see different kinds of tools, data sets, real-time uh, real tools to, to, to make decisions in real time for real people. And the goal of this with this uh, precision framework is also increase the yield and decrease the use of the water and decrease or suppress uh, the weeds in the field. That is pretty important. So this, in this framework and the things that we are doing with uh, artificial intelligence, IoT systems and the smart systems are also uh, in the goal of the Precision Sustainable Agriculture project. And we have a lot of elements in this project uh, we have not only the platforms that we are working, also the farmers are working with us. We have also the databases connected and we are working around, around the country with this project. And, and this is pretty important in this kind of efforts where we need to bridge the technology in between the users and the real problem that they have. We need to create a good network. And this is the thing that also, also that the Precision Sustainable Agriculture has. It's, the, it's a great network where uh, we can see their industry, academy, um, and another kind of organizations uh, that if we can work together, we can improve and we can close this gap in between the technology and the users. And we need to think about that we have a smart, a smart farming now. So the, the, um, the farming now is smart. So all growers are taking decisions because they know made decisions. But these decisions maybe are not are not the if the I know are not the, the efficient or the best decision to, to take. So for that reason, we need to think about the, the solutions and the problems that they are facing to find the proper, uh, the proper solution for them. For that reason, maybe at some point we need to think about, it's, a, it's not a smart farming, we need to create like a, a smarter farming with this kind of technology. And to close or to, to bridge the user and the technology, we need to think about different in, in the, the systems with these conditions or, specific, or specifications we need to think about low cost, user friendly, easy to maintenance, and also that itself the technology that we are making is answering a need uh, that the user has. Also, so something that we are understanding and learning with this kind of process is that we need to have a very good documentation of the technology and also is no is 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 pretty important. It's, it's one of the things that, that are more important in in this um, in this pipeline is also improve the communication with the farmer. To improve the communication, we need to improve the education and the extension related with the technology. So when we talk about smarter agriculture. So we need to think about that we are, uh, we are talking about communication systems. We are in rural, rural areas. We need to improve the, the communication. We don't have signal, cellular signal there. So we need to work more in this kind of uh, technologies. Also improve a little bit the telematics and position tech as a GPS, precision GPS, but also low cost. 
work with sensors to identify deep internet con of conditions uh, and also work in hardware and software platforms to improve um, or to answer uh, the needs that the farmer has. And also something that is pretty important is the data analytics solution and the software applications, because at the end, these, th these things will, will be the, uh, the door or the window that the farmer could, could see of the technology. And it's the interface, how the farmer could, could work with this specific technology is using the apps that we have how the farmer uh, can understand better the data that is coming from that uh, sensors or hardware and software platforms is because we have a very good data analytics solutions. And, and this is pretty important. And so in following this pipeline and having in mind that we need to have low, low cost, easy to use and easy to maintain systems, we have right now three main uh, products. So one of them is the stress cam. The stress cam is a phenocam, is IoT, low cost, a smart camera system. Which one you can take a look of the plants that you have in the field, soybean or cotton for now, and identify the water stress using machine learning algorithms that we have inside of the device. So here we are applying edge computing and we are sending part of the information to the cloud. And the user could use a tech dashboard to understand better the information that the camera is taking. We are not sending images to the cloud. We are sending just personal information with the result or the, the final result of, of the algorithm that is running inside of the device. So for that reason, he, this system is related with edge computing. The second project is the WIT 3D project. It's a production system working properly uh, for improving the width quantification task. In this case, this is a, a tool for researchers to, um, to measure or quantize the, how, how much widths we have in the field, the distribution, the coverage, and the species. In this case, we are also using a local system because in this case we are using a simple a GoPro camera with an app, Android app, to control the camera and also control uh, the way that we are creating the database. Uh, we can assign metadata. We can understand better where the information where uh, the, where the information was uh, was taken, and we can identify also after that in the database. Uh, the biomass that the research the researcher could uh, identify in the field, and the third one is the benchpot, and the benchpot is a low cost open source solution for non destructing high throughput phenotyping. This is pretty important, uh, not only for uh, for the PSA project. I think that for all people that is doing phenotyping, is pretty important. So this is like a, a like autonomous machine working inside of the greenhouse with the possibility to move the camera uh, over this line of pots and take images during the day during the week and during the month automatically and also we are working with we were working with the pipeline to improve a little bit how we can create the database for these kind of systems this is a low cost platform, it's, a, it's simple to use and also it's also easy to maintain. It. I want to talk about um, more of, of this project. So we have results for the three of, of them. But now I think that I want to be more focused in the mature project that is the stress camp. And I can show you. So this stress cam is um, is a low cost, easy to use and easy to maintain, but also is a compu this computer vision system is working in critical conditions. And we, when we are talking about critical condition in computer vision, we are talking about outdoor conditions, 
on this data movement of the camera, occlusion and shadows coming from coming by the canopy. But also we need to think that the camera will be installed the complete season outside. We have high or low temperatures and the camera needs to support hurricanes or, or, or another kind of weather conditions. So we were working with this camera for three years and we have right now a very good prototype to that is, is possible to replicate. So the, we have the in the line, this is the, the camera for the uh, 2019, uh, 2020, we have some improvements regarding powers. The power is pretty important because we don't have uh, the we, we don't have the power in the in the in the field, so we need to use the sun radiation to use the the solar I mean, use the solar panels to produce the the energy to the to the camera. And also, we were improving uh, a lot of things re uh, related with the box, the enclosure, and the mechanical part. So right now, we have this camera; it's pretty good. And also, we are working this year in another version of the camera. This camera, this camera here, uh, is is working with the cellular modem. It's sending the payload through the 2G 3G system to the cloud. But this camera is working with a new technology that Microsoft is also uh, leading the, this project. It's a TV wire spaces system. And it's using, basically it's using, it's creating a, a network using the TV wire spaces, uh, the, the spaces in the, in the spectrum of the television radio that are available to use and just is, mounting the signal there and it's possible to transmit large uh, distance in between the field and the farm. So in this case, we are using the camera as a client, sending the information through the signal that is covered as over this TV wire space. And in the farm, we are able to send the information to the cloud because the farm itself could have the connectivity. In that case, we are solving the the problem with the connectivity. And we have a lot of issues. As I told you, during the three years, we have a lot of issues with the cooling system. All times we were working during the summer, so the conditions that we have were uh, critical. Uh, we were working so, uh, so hard in the power solution. Uh, also improving, improving, improving and also uh, implementing the matching vision and matching learning uh, in inside of the device. So the device doesn't need a server or a, a powerful tool to process the images. The camera itself that is working with a tiny, tiny computer is able to do that. So we have here different versions of the camera and the improvements, re re the improvements related power consumption. And more or less, this is the thing that we are expecting to see. So for example, here you can see a corn image uh, at 6 p.m. and we can detect water stress here. Also for soybean, we can see how the water stress is coming when the leaves are flipping. So we have the implementation of these uh, matching these images inside of the device because we were working so hard also with another another teams and labs to process and create the, the deep learning and matching learning models. The, the camera takes more or less to, uh, in between 10 and 20 seconds to process one image, but also the camera is, is just taking one image every 15 minutes. So the time is enough. The window, the window of time is enough to process the image. And more or less, this is the aspect uh, of, uh, of the camera, the last version of the camera. It's, it's so clean, it's simple to use, and it's also simple to replicate. To replicate. This is an open source system that we have all information available in the GitHub repository. And if you are interested, also you are able to replicate, replicate this. Also, we have the tech dashboard that, as I told you, is, is the window that we have with the end user and how they can, uh, know, they, can um, um, they can know how the camera is working. So 
or the, the possibility to see the data coming directly from one camera. They are not able to see the images, but they are able to see if the plants has if the plants have or not water stress. So here, for example, this is one example of the payload. So you can see here the probability of water stress in the class number one, the probability of the water stress in the class number two, and the probability of the water stress in the class number three. In this case, the, um, the bigger probability is in the water stress one, and this is sending also in the payload. We have here also information about the farm, uh, where the camera is installed, and the timestamp. That is very important. So, also for TY spaces, we are doing this deployment, and we have this deployment installed in uh, in one of our uh, NCSU research stations. So. Uh, just to finish, a stress cam is a phenocam that could be used for different cases, pest and stress detection. It can interpret the data from its um, embedded uh, machine learning, increase the autonomy of the farm equipment, and this kind of technology could be implemented easier in our uh, de developing countries. So this is something that also um, it's, it's pretty important to know that it's also, this technology could impact another countries. So the system is not only low cost, but also easy to use um, due to the for the four team for creating a good protocols for the setting up, installation, and maintenance. This is also open source project that you could be able to replicate with the proper open source community rules. So this is the this is the things that I have for to tell you today. So if you have questions, uh, please let me know. I'm pretty, pretty happy to answer those questions. But before to finish, I want also to, to, to talk about a little reflect, um, a, a little thought that I have regarding the challenges for the future. So we are in this computer vision community. So in, in, we, need to, we need to see how the computer vision community could impact uh, in a positive way the agriculture. And we need to, the, the challenge that we have as a community is that we need to, to create a very good way and roadmap to identify where the solution of the, uh, uh, for the agriculture are. So if you have a solution, if you have a problem, just, I think that the community, the computer vision community could, could create a very good solution for you. But in this case, we need to think all time, uh, who is the end user of the technology? We need to create better accessibility, uh, condition of the use, condition of the of use uh, for using technology for the end users. Also, we need to think uh, that we are working in outdoor in critical conditions. So we are not working in a normal industry. We are working in, a, in an industry that you don't know what is going on outside. Could be so hot, you can have a full radiation today, a cloudy day, could be a, ra um, a rainy day. So you can see a lot of conditions and you, can, you need to prepare your equipment to do that. Also, it's pretty important to think about the, the role of the open source community. So in, in these years, uh, I think that we can see how the machine learning algorithms are improving day by day. And this is because we have the availability of red or, or to the accessibility for the real data. And with this real data, we can also create new algorithms and we can create more, inf more, more solutions. Um, and that's it. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, Paula. And that concludes our conference. So thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around. I know we ran way over. Um, and I wanted to give a shout out to people to please join our next conference on February 10th and to join our hackathon as well. Um, Libby just put in a link to, um, to learn more about the AgTech series. 
But with that, I will say thank you. Libby, any final parting words? No, I think that you covered it, Jess. Thanks so much to everyone for sticking it out and for being here and for such active engagement. And we'll be in touch about how to view all of the recordings in the next week or so.